minute or two. Um, we want everyone to keep their microphones muted, and we uh, want you to uh, have an opportunity to ask questions, um, and we'll let you know when that uh, time has come. Uh, Linda, I think you have a slide presentation to present for us that I can talk us through. Can someone for, for a second just confirm that uh, uh, we, uh, we are live on the link that I shared earlier before we start? But I think yes, I think it should be live. One second. I'm trying to share everything in here. Uh, Chad, can you push the uh, record button also, or uh, you don't have to do it anymore? I don't know. Let's see if I can get in there in between all the entries of, I'm doing here. Okay. Oh, okay, perfect. So we have lots of confirmations on the recording and the live stream. Oh, okay, perfect. So, Linda, do you have a slide presentation for us? And I've added uh, our welcome to another 10 people. Greetings. We're getting started now. Can you push the recording button, please? Yep, let's go, Linda. All right, boy, another f six people. Okay, so I apologize with everybody for all the all the technical issues we had so far this morning. Uh, but uh, it seems like everything starts to fall in place and work. Uh, we have today uh, with us Dan Sullivan, uh, the author of the official Google Cloud study gets for professional architect, uh, professional data engineer, and associate of cloud engineer. So uh, we are all his fans. Most of us, we have his book and his posts. Uh, finally, we get to meet him uh, today. And uh, uh, send it over to Chad and uh, Fausto to a short presentation. Yep, so uh, welcome. Uh, if this is your first Google Developer Group meeting, uh, we welcome you. What the Google Developer Group is, uh, is a group of folks that get together and learn uh, and share uh, technology. Uh, sometimes there are social events that we do. Um, most of the time we're uh, getting smarter uh, with the help of each other and with the help of experts uh, like the folks that we have today. Um, we will have prizes, and those uh, Linda and I pay for personally. No, I'm joking. We have always sponsors that are there to uh, provide uh, um, incentive and, and fun stuff for us. Uh, so we'll talk about that, but do stick around for the wheel of names that we will be spinning later. Uh, if you're new you're going to hear this dinging that's as i let people in so that's sort of non-stop and a little distracting for me so forgive me if i keep looking looking this way uh linda what's the next slide oh we may have lost linda one second my computer started to act weird act weird one second yep one second we'll get those slides back up um, the members of the GDG group include Jason Rotella. He is our founding member. He started the group many years ago. I wish I had a date on that. I should have written that down. Also, we have Fausto, who has been involved in all of our uh, events, helping us with planning. And um, he, he's with us here today somewhere out there. Hello, Fausto, if you want to say hello. I know that he was uh, in the pre-planning meetings. There we go. 
welcome. Um, Blaine is another member. He was responsible for getting a lot of our social media set up, our the the meetup site, the um, oh gosh, our our website domain. So uh, a lot of the technical setup, uh, Blaine is responsible for. Um, there's myself. I'm the newest member, and have been uh, I guess around for almost a year now. And then of course we all know Linda, who's been so important. In, and and has provided all the energy, all the gas that drives us, um, or I guess the electric powered vehicle battery, right? So thank you, Linda. Um, what's the next slide? Thank you, guys. So one second. I had some technical difficulties. <laughs> this is good. Let's, so this slide, we already talked about this before we started recording, uh, but let's just go over this again. Um, uh, just know that you're sort of in a public space. If you don't want to be seen, you know, uh, turn your camera off. And we'd ask that you go ahead and mute your microphone. Sounds like, it's very quiet right now, so everyone has figured that out. Uh, it's funny. It's almost like it used to be when you go into a theater or you know some place you would silence your cell phone. Now everyone's being asked to mute their microphones. Um, so there it should be a time for Q and A. And during that time, when you are able to speak, that's a great time to turn on your camera if you so choose. We would love to see you and, and create that interaction. Um, we are actually here in the slide. There is a actually here in the slides. There is a mistake. I didn't update it. For the Q and A, we have a, a website slido you know, set up for the questions. So all your questions, please. Uh, post them there, not here in chat. Here in chat is only to socialize. Great, thank you. That's awesome. And the best uh, piece of information in this document is to be excellent to each other. That's how uh, these Google things go, and I'm sure uh, you'll enjoy the time we're going to have. Linda, what's the next slide? So yes, for all the social media media streams, these are the hashtags to use. Um, if you want to, you know, uh, learn about these event, events in the future, or if you want to share this event that's, as it's happening now, uh, this is the place to go. You'll find um, the the GDG um, uh, and the Women Tech Makers um, links there. Uh, so check out those uh, organizations. We have information uh, in other places that you can check out there. What's the next slide, Linda? Is the agenda. Oh, today, yeah. So we're in the middle of this right now. We're doing our opening remarks. You know, we talked about the recording. Uh, we're just about to introduce Dan Sullivan, and he will give his presentation. Linda just uh, shared that link where you can post your questions. So, um, you know, uh, please feel free to use that as he's uh, giving us his knowledge. 2.30, raffle time. That's the wheel of names. That's a lot of fun. Um, so hang around for that. And then we will uh, wrap up and we'll, we'll have the closing uh, comments. And then at that point, we usually just open up the mic and and uh, allow everyone to, you know, uh, just co-mingle. So I don't think the... Well, what's the next slide? Let's see if I missed anything or is it time to talk to Dan? Is the question for, for the Q&A? Yep. Yeah. So everybody got the, can somebody post uh, in the chat uh, or uh, anywhere else this link? If, I don't know if, it, even in YouTube, I think it's shared, so. Yes, it's already in the mm -hmm. description, thank you. So here are all the GDGs organizers uh, that participate today with us uh, uh, to make this event uh, uh, so great. So. Uh, just so you, you can see a little bit, we are from all over the world. And here are the numbers for the RSPB uh, for today. So uh, I think we will go a little bit uh, more than usual. <laughs> so, and, uh, and I would like to thank everybody who uh, made it possible and uh, uh, join us and collaborate and all that and this that are here. All of this will not be possible. And uh, here are our uh, sponsors. And uh, I, I would uh, like to let uh, some of our uh, 
GDGs to present uh, our sponsors and what they are offering. Daniel, do you want to start? Uh, I can. I can you share the slide that are about the menu? Uh, we were. Oh, okay. So give me just a second. So, thank you. So. I'm from Toronto, I'm from Toronto User Group, and like over the last two years, many publishing uh, was a sponsor giving one title for the meetup. However, this is a big meetup, so we needed more titles. And many generously offered uh, not one, but five titles in the raffle. Uh, you, so the instructions for this one, I will not limit you to the titles uh, uh, you want to get. Uh, you can log into their website, to your portal, create an account if you don't have it. Choose any of the ebooks, video courses, or live projects. That's a net news we're going to be doing COVID times. Uh, and then add it to a shopping cart. After the raffle, so start doing that right now. After the raffle, uh, you will uh, ping me the email address you use money portal. And as a fourth stop, we'll move it to your dashboard as if you purchase it. So they're really good. Like uh, I think like they helped me my own digital transformation the last four years. Uh, I got here through their books. They don't have too many Google titles, so I don't want to limit to this is a really good book uh, on, on Google. The general principles of anything about. Next, uh, let's see. The next, uh, I think it's O'Reilly. Michelle, are you? Yes, Shelly. Yeah, hello, everyone. Uh, this is Michelle from Diddy Houston. Who really has been offering a 30 day access to entire catalog so you can have access to all their Oreally books, video courses, conferences they had. And this is really awesome. They also even have some sandboxes to play with. Yeah, just please make sure to stay till the end, uh, get the link, and then sign up today so you can get 30 days access. So, uh, the, the, this will be for everybody in the call who stays until the end. Right? Because it, yeah. break, it was breaking up them. Yeah, this is for everyone who stays until the end. Okay. Uh, John, are you ready to talk about the next? Is John in the call? John Davis? This John? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I uh, was just uh, getting ready to message you to say that we have the, uh, for the raffle, but <clears throat> it sounds like we're going to have the prizes for you to be and the prizes for Manning publications. Yeah, so uh, can we talk about the course that, uh, dance course that we are having on the raffle? Uh, yeah, so <clears throat> during the raffle, there will be three prizes for uh, Udemy classes, which are for, uh, that Dan has a, a nice class up there, and we go for, through that each Sunday. Uh, and so not only do you get a chance to win the Manning publications, but you also get a chance to take Dan's class for free, which is shown there, the ACE uh, Associate Cloud Engineer certificate. So uh, the next we have, uh, we will have also two scholarships, 50% uh, discount from Practic uh, Young Black. Uh, uh, to choose from the web developer, data scientist, data analyst, uh, the codes will be valid until June 30th. Practicum is a fully supportive remote bootcamp to land your uh, ideal dead job. Students receive 24 7 support from doctors, code reviews, and peers. Uh, learn the soft skills, then they will get. Uh, that will get them hired and create uh, up to 15 life or projects. So this will be for the wrapper for today. So where we left. This is a little bit like a Marvel movie where you have to watch all the way through the credits and then you'll, you know, there's a little thing, a little nugget at the end. Uh, that's what we have our, our prizes, but you got to wait. You got to go all the way through. Okay, so remember to post your questions in the form. Uh, uh, and uh, our, uh, we want to thank all our sponsors. We want to thank Dan for joining us. And uh, uh, Karen, are you ready? 
I'm ready. Hi, I'm Kevin G. Nuremberg, uh, tuning in from Europe. I want to introduce Dan Sullivan. Dan Sullivan is uh, 60. Uh, he software architect, science, and cloud architecture. Dan is the author of the official Google Cloud Study Guides, was a professional architect, professional data and also a cloud engineer certifications. Um, yeah, he is also an instructor, instructor of Out and it should be at the bottom if you uh, hover, if you hover your screen, it should be here at the bottom. Now it says I am presenting because I present, I can stop, but if you hover here, you should uh, be able yes, to Yes, showing up on my, let's see. Uh, it might be that you have to click, even in mine, it's kind of, uh, it's kind of tricky today because too many attendees, so you you have to click hit the bottom and it will show. Yeah, yeah it's not showing up on mine. I am clicking on that one. I think I'm going to jump into another browser or another window and just see if I can log in. Mm -hmm. Okay. And see if I can grab the presenting. Present. There we go. All right, I'm going to drop off this other one. As expected. There are problems when you go live. And we want to apologize and thank you for your patience. Dan's back and he's presenting. We see your slides, Dan. While he's setting this up, uh, folks in the chat, uh, is, has anyone already got a Google certification similar to what we're talking about today? Which one, Amat? Nice, data engineer. That's great. Yep, I see AWS as well. A lot of cloud certifications available these days, right? I think he's trying to enter. Oh, okay. Then only so you know you are muted. Very good. Okay, how is that? There we go. Uh, no, it's not working. We do see your slides, yes. Ah, oh, okay, so uh, Again, my name is Dan Sullivan, and I'm really looking forward to talking about uh, Google Cloud uh, Certification Exams and the Associate Cloud Engineer Exam in particular. Um, first, I just want to thank all the GDG groups that organized this, and especially Linda who um, did all the work to step this up and made it very easy for me to, um, to do this. So I really I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you to everybody. A um, couple of things I just want to um, just make sure everybody understands. Um,
exam. And ideally, if the exam's, you know, you pass positive, then that actually reflects that you do actually know the material and are qualified. And that's, that's really a true positive. Now, a true negative, now that shows up when the exam says, yeah, you don't really know your stuff, and actually you don't. Um, and that can happen, right? If I didn't know enough, I, w I wouldn't have passed the test. Uh, one thing that Google is very good at is designing exams that don't lead to false positives, which means I don't really know the material, but I sort of gamed the exam, figured out how to guess really well, and I managed to pass the exam. That is highly unlikely. The danger area is this false negative, which is you actually know your stuff. And if you were sitting at the command line or working with the console, you could blow through and do this stuff and you know, spin up virtual machines and be able to monitor a Kubernetes cluster. And you actually know the material. The thing about the exam, it didn't capture that. And then you end up, it's the thing I want to focus on in this first part of the exam. I want to help avoid that situation. So we're going to talk about um, how to get started and, and what the exam is like. So, um, people, uh, another common question I get is, well, you know, what do I need to study? How long should I study? Um, and, and my answer is on the keyboard. Start working with the console. Get into Google Cloud. And it's you start Google, um, give you a $300 credit for signing up. Um, you, just, you just need an email address. $300 will get you a long way in Google Cloud um, if you're not spinning up large clusters and things like that. Um, but from a studying perspective and just kind of uh, working, working through things like that, $300 is a lot of money. Um, also, there are, is something called the free tier, and that is a, a set of resources that are available to you even after you've spent the $300 credit, you will always be able to have, say, like a gig of storage in Firestore, or you can run an F1 micro instance um, just continuously. You'll never be charged for that. And so um, you can check out what's available in the free tier at uh, googlecloud.com slash free. So um, the first thing to know about passing this exam is I can't imagine how somebody could pass the exam without having spent a good amount of time actually working with Google Cloud. Uh, there is an exam guide for every, uh, every test or every certification exam, and they're available on the uh, Google website as well. I strongly recommend uh, looking that over. Um, as soon as you decide you want to take a particular certification exam, the first thing I would do is go to the exam guide, because um, that lays out really um, what's covered in the exam. And I have found that the exam guide is really reflective of the exam itself. So if you have a good handle on the topics that are covered in the exam guide, you should be in pretty good shape with regards to um, the exam itself. Now, there's a lot of resources um, that are available. Um, Coursera, a lot of courses, and they are free. And these courses, many of these courses were developed by folks at Google. And in general, Coursera courses are excellent. I've, I've never seen a bad Coursera course. Um, so I would highly recommend taking any Coursera course. Um, another thing um, you can do, and I, I didn't make a slide for this, is on YouTube, um, Google makes available all of the talks from uh, Google Cloud Next, which is the annual conference for Google Cloud. And the talks are excellent. Some of them are beginner talks, some are more intermediate, and some are really in-depth. So if there's an area you're not particularly strong in, say, you know, networking isn't your thing or security isn't your thing, and you want to sort of dive down deeper, I would strongly recommend checking out YouTube and searching for Google Cloud Next and seeing what kind of security talks or networking talks are there and watch those and really, really take advantage of those. Uh, there's the Udemy course that I did that's available. Um, online as well. And also, it, I have a website, dancelwinlearning.com. You can go to that. Um, that'll have links to various resources. 
Um, and as I do new stuff, new courses, and new resources, I'll make um, make them available from there. Okay, um, I just want to do a tech check and just see what Chad or, or Linda are think sound going okay and is the slides continuing to work. We should be okay. We had some trouble with the, the live stream, but I think that otherwise we're all right. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, just some people are trying to join now. If someone accepts. Yep, yep, I've, I've just, just let another 10 or 15 yeah, people in, so that's uh, happening also. Yep. And feel free, Chad and Linda and, and other you know, organizers, feel free to jump in any time and interrupt. This is uh, very informal from my perspective. Uh, um, okay, so uh, the, the nature of the exam at a, at a very high, high level. Now what I'd like to do is kind of drill down into... Um, specific things that you can do to help um, uh, prepare for the exam. So first of all, there's, there's the study strategy. So how do you prepare for the exam? Uh, um, definitely the first thing is really study the exam guide and understand what are the tasks that are involved. By the time you take the exam, you should be able to go back to that exam guide and, and like look at each of those um, detailed bullets and, and feel like, yeah, I understand how to do that. And I think that's a good sort of criteria for assessing, uh, you know, am I ready to take the exam? Um, so there's that. Look at the exam guide and make sure you feel comfortable with the topics. And then also take the practice exam. Google provides a, I think it's about 20 questions, uh, a 20 question practice exam for all of their certification tests. And that's a good one to take. And it's also helpful to take early on, like when you're first starting, just so you can see what kind of questions they ask. Um, so, for example, Google's uh, exam questions are usually scenario-based. Don't ask something like, what's the, the largest uh, maximum database uh, in a cloud SQL database? You know, and it's for 30 gig. They don't ask questions like that. Um, it's much more scenario-based. And so um, you need to know, like some of those, those like where's the cut, how big a database can be, but you're not going to be explicitly asked that. I've never seen a question like that. Um, another thing about study strategy, um, and both the exam guide and the practice test can help with this, is you want to identify your weakest areas. Um, and often what happens is, like in our work, we focus on like one or two things, like one or two areas. Like I do a lot of work on databases. and and moving data around like um, but I don't do a lot of work in networking you know I might do some initial starting a new project but um, for the most part networking is really not my daily way so when I was like that's something I had to really focus on because it's just not something I do one of the most challenging things about the, the associate exam is the breadth. So while something like um, the professional data engineer is narrow and deeper, um, and it's in that way, the associate cloud is very broad. So you just want to make sure um, that you don't try and depend on really acing your strong areas and then risk failing on the, you know, or not getting the questions right on the areas you're not strong with, um, because you really risk not passing at that point. And then, again, going back to the idea, you know, you really want to have some hands. It's great to read the documentation, read the books, take the courses, work with Quick Labs. Um, Quick Labs is an excellent way to get started. Even after you've done that, it's really important to work with Google Cloud in an unstructured kind of way. Just jump in and start spinning up um, instance groups and, you know, shut down a, a server in an instance group, you know, and make it look like it, it crashed and see what happens. I really struck, strongly recommend trying to break things, like try to get error messages, um, do things, because one, because the error messages are often good at helping um, sort of reveal the, the design or the architecture of things and how things work together. Um, and it also helps us understand the limits of our knowledge. So definitely um, 
get in and uh, try and do things you don't understand how to do. So that's the basic study strategy. Now, on the day of the exam, um, Google now has online exams since uh, the start of the pandemic. Um, Google offers uh, online exams for associate cloud engineer, I think data engineer and architect. I don't know if any of the others have been rolled over to online. So um, at this time, you can take them online, and I, I've never done that, uh, so I don't know the details. I've been the proctored, so somehow somebody's monitoring. The other option, go to a center, which might be at a, a university or a, you know an office building in your area where there's a, a professional test center, and you can sit down at a top machine and basically um, go through a, an application that 50 questions. And so it's a time cast. You have two hours, and there are 50 questions. And the questions, mostly they're um, multiple choice, and you pick one. Sometimes there are multiple answers. Um, and one of the nice things about the way Google structures the exam is you can mark your questions for review. So you'll see one question per screen. And, it's, um, and we'll take a look at uh, some of these questions in a minute. You have one question per screen, and then down, I think it's in the lower left corner, there's a little checkbox you can mark as, you know, mark for review. Um, so you can, you can go through um, the whole test or at any time click on another link within the, within the screen, and it'll go back and it'll show you a list of the 50 questions, and it'll flag which ones you've marked so you can quickly jump around to ones you want to um, review a second time. So... Um, so that's one thing to know about uh, taking the exam. Another thing to know is that you really have to read the questions carefully. And the first thing you want to do is like, I try and identify what are the key services and like software they're talking about. Um, is this a question about, say, BigQuery? And is it about data, BigQuery and data warehousing? Is it about um, containers? And if it's about containers, is it about App Engine or Kubernetes Engine, if either of those? So you want to kind of um, immediately identify what's the sort of the topic area that you're dealing with. And then you want to look for very specific technical requirements. Um, and this could be things like, you know, from the uh, command line, how do you do X? Or it might be you have a database that's um, 50 gigabytes and you need to this data something, you know, you want to kind of I quickly identify those things. Anything where there's a, a number, that, like um, some kind of parameter or configuration information, that is often important. Um, my working assumption is that, it, you know, anytime there's a number in a question, there, there, there's something important about that, so you want to take note of that. Um, and then, again, you know, reading care you also have to read carefully because sometimes there there may be two services mentioned or two different things. Like you might be talking about projects and storage. And it's like, where is this a question, a storage question, or is this about string projects? So you want to make sure you're able to, to determine really what the question is about. And um, I'd say from a test taking strategy is that typically um, there are four options to, um, to a question. Sometimes there's five. Oftentimes, there's one or two options that you can pretty quickly throw out, um, and you can do that by um, looking at the technical details and, like, the key search. And you can often I identify, well, this is really not relevant, and you can eliminate those. But you're often left with two that are very similar, and sometimes with questions, two of the options are so similar, they might only differ by one or two words. So again, this is you have to read the questions carefully, and then figure out, you know, what word is off or words different, and then keep that in mind and reread the question, and then you can probably figure out um, which which of those two uh, options are the actual answer. Okay, so what do you need to know? Well, definitely um, at a at a really broad and need to know identity and access management. It's all over the place. And this is across all the exams, or at least the, the three I talk about. Um, engineer, architect, and associate engineer are um, 
are really heavy on identity and access management, and it and it as it should be because it's so important in like real life. Um, so the things you want to understand is you want to understand the distinction between roles and permissions. So permissions are basically grants or which allow you to do a certain operation, and those permissions are grouped together into roles. And you don't assign permissions directly to users or groups or identities. You, you assign roles to them. And there are um, kinds of roles. There are um, predefined roles, and those are ones that we typically use. They're, and those are ones that Google provides. They've basically looked at how people um, set up their team, they're working in the cloud, and they've identified common tasks or common um, sets of responsibilities, and then they kind of group permissions together so that someone in a particular role should have all the permissions they need. Now, of course, there may be times where the roles, that the predefined roles that Google provides are not sufficient, and you need to customize them, and you can do that with custom roles. Those are the ones we usually use. In rare cases, or in a limited set of cases, you can use something known as the primitive roles. And those are the roles that um, came with Google Cloud years ago. And this was before identity and the identity and access management service was released. The primitive roles are, are very basic and they're very broad. And you typically only use those like in a development environment or where you have a very small group. Um, but generally in a production environment, like with a, in a real organization or enterprise, you're using some combination of predefined and primitive. Um, so you want to know the types of identities, so things like um, service accounts, um, user identities, which are associated with like a Gmail address, um, groups. You just want to understand those different ones. Uh, so that's identity and access management. On the networking side, uh, this is a tough area for those of you like me who don't do a lot of networking because it, even within networking, the topics are so broad. So you need to understand about virtual private clouds and subnets, subnet addressing. Um, so if you're not familiar with like what a CIDR block is or how to read an IP address with a you know, and then some number after it, like slash 24, if you don't know what that means, it's really important to, to kind of bone up on that because there, there are sometimes there are questions you have to be able to like look at an IP address and figure out is this gonna be routed or is this, uh, you know, is this a private address and it won't be routed? So um, you definitely wanna look at that. Also, firewall rules are important. Um, for the associate cloud engineer, I don't think DNS is as important as it is on like the architecture exam, but you should know the basics of that. And hybrid cloud is uh, it's pervasive in the real world, and so it's on the exam. And, and the idea behind hybrid cloud is that in large organizations and enterprise, they're going to have some on-premises um, servers and storage and other resources, and you want to share like those resources with processes that are running in the cloud. And so the question is set up networks or a network or networking between your on-premise resources and your uh, cloud Google Cloud resources. Okay, not all the services are sort of questioned or, or, or examined at the same level. However, the compute and storage, those are ones you really want to make sure you understand. You definitely compute engine and how to create uh, GPUs, uh, for example, and customize them. There are some extra um, security measures like shielded VMs um, that Google makes available. Um, you want to understand what this and why you you know, why you might want to use that. You also want to understand about preemptible virtual machines. Um, and the idea there is you can get a very low, uh, low cost, about 80% of the usual price for a VM um, with an understanding that it'll run for at most 24 hours before Google takes it back and Google my time. So, so preemptible machines are, are great if you a uh, highly fault tolerant system because um, it can save you a lot of money and, you know, basically, um, if you can recover from a failure pretty quickly, that's a good option. App Engine. Um, App Engine has two additions. There's uh, standard and flexible. The App Engine standard is um, the original App Engine, and that is language-specific 
sandbox-based service. So there's like a Python sandbox or a, uh, um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on the other languages that are supported, like Node.js. Um, Java? And, oh, Java, is Java, I think is new. Okay, great, thank you. Um, oh, and that's the other thing. That's a question, I wasn't, I wasn't an answer. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, sorry, no, uh, Java, oh, Java just came out for Cloud Functions. I don't know if it's an App Engine yet, but that's a great question. I will Okay, that up. thank you, because I, I have seen it in, in Cloud Functions. Yep. Yep, yeah, yeah, no, but that's a good question. I'm not sure if it's an App Engine yet, uh, or App Engine Standard. App Engine Flexible, um, you can basically specify your own Docker image. So if you wanted to run something in a Java environment um, or some other JVM language and you wanted to use App Engine, you could configure a, a, Docker, excuse me, a Docker image with all of the, you know, the JVM and what other, whatever libraries you might need and run that in App Engine. Um, so that's one way to work with containers is App Engine. The other is with Kubernetes Engine. And uh, Kubernetes Engine is a managed Kubernetes, and so basically you specify how big you want your cluster to be, how you want it configured, and not have to worry um, with a lot of the lower level implementation details of Kubernetes. Now, Kubernetes is an open source project, so you could go out and download you know, the Kubernetes platform and install it on a bunch of virtual machines that you run in Compute Engine, but that's a lot to manage that. Um, so you might run into a question where um, you have to choose between managing your own Kubernetes cluster and compute engine or running a cluster in Kubernetes engine and letting Google essentially manage a lot of it. Um, generally, um, you know, it's a better option to let Google manage, um, manage that kind of thing. Uh, cloud functions is the other thing. Um, probably not, as, you don't need to know it as in depth as the other three, but you really want to be familiar with it. Um, I, I don't think Google generally asks questions like which languages are on there available on, or can you use on cloud functions because it, it just changes so much um, or things change frequently in Google Cloud in terms of expanding set of languages. So um, the key thing about cloud functions are, um, you know, what, how long, what's the longest duration a function can run, um, what kind of events can trigger a function to execute. And just understand the cloud function is for basically event processing. So if something happens in one of your Google Cloud resources, and then you want to sort of start something, you want to execute something in response to that. Now, Cloud Run and Anthos, both um, new services since, uh, well, since the time I wrote the book and did the, the Udemy course, I don't know how heavily those are covered on the Associate Cloud Engineer. Um, Anthos is pretty complicated. I wouldn't expect there to be a lot on that. Cloud Run might be covered. Um, Cloud Run managed service um, for running containers. So it is a third option for running containers. Um, one of the things to keep in mind about Cloud Run is that any container you run now in Cloud Run has to be stateless. So you can, for example, have uh, uh, persistent disk detached with information that you want to be able to persist and carry, say, across instances of a container. So if your container were to, to crash or be shut down and it, another, instant, uh, another instance of it spins up, you're not going to have access to any state information that was uh, maintained in the previous version. So that's a restriction with Cloud Rod. That's probably one thing you want to keep in mind um, with regards to Cloud Rod. With regards to storage, um, you definitely want to know cloud storage uh, pretty much in depth. And cloud storage is pretty basic uh, in the sense of the, the features that it has. There are different, um, uh, I can't think, I'm sorry, drawing a blank on the words, but they're like different levels. There's sort of regional and multi-regional, which is sort of what we use for our actively um, used data. There's nearline storage, uh, which is a little less expensive. And the rule with nearline storage is typically you want to keep that to uh, data that you expect to access uh, once per 30 days or less. Um, and then there's cold line storage, and the general rule of thumb there is you expect to access data uh, once per year or less. And then there's also there's um, storage, which is another one. I'm not as familiar with that. That's also sort of a new service. 
But um, so you want to understand like that level of cloud storage. Also, um, I, access controls through, around cloud storage. You want to make sure you're comfortable with that. And I'm sure I'll think of something else about cloud storage. Uh, the other things you want to understand are, are BigQuery. You'll probably get questions on that because it's just a popular um, service. It is a managed data warehousing service. So it allows you to run petabyte scale data warehousing without having to worry about servers. So um, a lot of organizations and enterprise that have big data warehouses are tussling with uh, um, maintaining clusters and scaling and things like that turn to BigQuery. Cloud PubSub is really important from an architecture perspective uh, because of messaging service. And one of the things it allows um, you to do from an architecture perspective is decouple your service. So you might have a front end that scale well, it can out a problem. So if you have a spike in, in um, demand for your website, um, you can scale up really quickly, say using um, instance groups and compute engine, or if you're running containers in Kubernetes, um, because it's stateless, you can just keep adding more containers and load balance across those. Now, each of those front ends is going to be doing some work. It's going to be, say, collecting data, but it's going to want to write to a database. Well, you might have a well, database on the back end. Databases do not scale as these front ends do. So um, you wouldn't want to, say, slow down your front end because your back end can't scale as quickly. So the way we avoid that is we decouple them by using Cloud PubSub. So the front end, instead of talking directly to the database, sends messages or writes data to a Cloud PubSub topic, and the database reads from that topic as it's able to. So sort of work can kind of queue up in the, in the Cloud PubSub topic, and Cloud SQL or an application that uses Cloud SQL will consume those messages and work on it at whatever rate it can. So um, Cloud PubSub is one of the things that allows us to deter and that's important from a mobility perspective. Um, Stackdriver has been um, recently renamed. Uh, Stackdriver was an acquisition uh, that Google made a few years ago, and it included uh, monitoring and losses, um, tracing, and debugging. There's several things that were part of the Stackdriver package. Uh, but basically, it's resources for understanding uh, your applications, your infrastructure, um, and monitoring. Um, so now I think it's called cloud monitoring, cloud logging, cloud debug, and so on. So you want to know those those um, sets of things, uh, excuse me, sets of services in depth. Now, <clears throat> to to a less detailed degree, you need to understand um, how to choose between different kinds of services, especially storage services. So Cloud SQL and Cloud Spanner are both relational databases, um, which means they use SQL. They, the sort of the organizing principle is a table, kind of like a spreadsheet, um, that kind of structure where you have fixed uh, columns, and each row represents a particular entity. Cloud SQL is really, uh, I believe the current limit is up to about 30 gig per database within Cloud SQL. If you need a database or a database that can scale horizontally, then you want to move to Cloud Spanner. Now, Cloud Spanner is also a relational database and it's transactional. So it can do things like, you know, people are putting in orders and you're saving orders and you're checking inventory and you're moving things out of inventory um, and you're doing a lot of up reading, writing, and updating. Um, at, at very high pace. That's that's kind of the transactional stuff. Any kind of application like that, um, typically those go into um, either Spanner or Cloud SQL if, it, if the data is highly structured. Now, um, BigQuery also uses SQL, but it is not a relational database. It's an analytical database. And the difference is the way we use it. So for example, with BigQuery, the pattern is we typically write data very rarely, if ever, updated. So we're constantly maybe adding more data. Also, when we query it, we're typically querying um, you know, many rows, but maybe few columns. And so BigQuery uses something called columnar storage. Um, and it's just a, a way of organizing the data 
it makes it highly likely when you go to read a, a block of data, um, you're actually going to get a lot of uh, a, a lot of the data that you'll pull back will be useful for the query. Um, and that's opposed to, say, if you're in a transactional system, typically what you want is you of the, the attributes associated with a thing, like a, a sales order. You want all the associated with that. Because you might say, update my order, so you need all that information. BigQuery, the, it's an analytical database for data warehousing, business chains. What you're typically doing is looking at the same attribute across many different rows. So, for example, how many sales did you make in a particular store on a particular day? That's the kind of query that um, is well, well executed in the BigQuery environment. So, port um, SQL, you can do joins, but it really is transactional. So, you just want to remember that one. Um, in addition to relational databases and analytic, the one analytical database, uh, Google has uh, no SQL databases as well. Uh, data store um, is one, and Cloud Bigtable is the other. Now, sort of the organizing model in Cloud Data Store, um, which is also now called, referred to as Cloud Firestore, is a document. And if you've ever seen like a JSON structure, um, that's essentially what a document is, where you can have nested levels, you have attribute value here, um, and then you some of the uh, values of those keys can be more structured things. Um, so if you're working with a flexible schema, um, data store is a uh, good use case, or that's a good use case for cloud data store. Cloud Bigtable is also used when you have a flexible schema, which means you know you might have a bunch of columns, very large number of columns, but you don't. Not every row will be will be using all. Um, that's a good indicator. A uh, good indicator that Bigtable might be a good option. Bigtable is known as a white column database, and the organizing principle there is something called a sparse multidimensional map. And basically, that's a big phrase, which means you know a lot of potential columns, but frequently they're not. Not all of them are used. With Bigtable, the criteria for choosing Bigtable is when you need very low latency writes at very high, um, high velocity. So for example, an in Internet of Things or IoT application, it's maybe writing large volumes of sensor data. Um, that's a good use for Bigtable. Um, Cloud Data Store, you know, you might think it's a NoSQL database, it can work, but it doesn't have that low latency write that Bigtable does. So anytime you're dealing with large volumes of data and you need to write very, and you're not gonna be doing a lot of updating, and Cloud Bigtable is an option for that. Cloud Storm is used for or you just need to store um, files somewhere. Cloud Storage is a good option. Um, it's, uh, Cloud Storage is also useful as sort of a, a landing area or a staging area between services. Um, so uh, Earl talked about how Cloud, Cloud PubSub um, allows us to decouple services because we can send messages between um, our services. Well, there's a maximum message size, I think it's 10 meg, um, that you can send in a cloud. If you need to share more data than that, say you're doing some kind of like an extraction mission load process, and you've got you know hundreds of meg you need to send to the next service, that's a good play, good scenario where cloud storage could be used. So you just write that data to a bucket, and then the next service can come and, and read from it. And in a case like that, <clears throat> you could use Cloud PubSub to send a message with a URL that to the bucket and the file that the next process should read. So actually store the data um, in cloud storage, and you use Cloud PubSub to tell the next service where to go find it. So those are the kind of things you might see with regards to questions about different storage systems. Now, um, another thing uh, you want to be familiar with is when to use certain managed services. And somebody at Google really loves putting, naming things cloud data something. So there's cloud data prop, cloud data flow, cloud data prep, cloud data lab, and sometimes I even have, and these are things I use all the time, I have trouble keeping the terminology straight. Cloud Data Proc is a managed um, Hadoop and Spark 
service. So that's used for big data processing. Um, generally, people turn to uh, Dataproc if they want to migrate from an on-premise Hadoop cluster, and they just they don't want the headaches of managing a Hadoop cluster anymore. Cloud Dataproc is a good option. Cloud Dataproc is often used for um, preparing or, or like very intensive data processing pipelines. Um, because Spark is a big data platform that um, has really a, a, a lot of tools and a rich set of um, machine learning libraries. That, uh, now, Cloud Dataflow it, service, it's also used to build, like, especially Cloud Dataflow supports both processing and batch processing. Now, the difference with batch processing, you, you will have a chunk of data and you have access to that chunk of data all at once. So, for example, you might extract data from a mainframe application and write it to a file and store it in cloud storage. And then you might run Cloud Dataflow, go read that file, do a bunch of pre uh, processing on that data, and write some other file out. That's batch processing. Stream processing is when um, the data arrives continuously. And so there is an end of the file, like last row, last piece of data, because it, it's continually streaming in. And Cloud Dataflow works well with that. Um, there, that's probably the, you know, most of what you need for Cloud Dataflow and Cloud Dataproc for the associate cloud engineer. Um, for the architect or data engineer, you would sort of drill down more into Cloud Dataflow and look at some of the features, like how it handles windowing for stream processing. Um, and I'd be happy to answer questions about those, but uh, that's probably, this is probably the right level of detail for, for the cloud engineer. Uh, data prep is another tool um, used for, for data. Um, that's mostly for things like preparing uh, data for machine learning. Cloud Data Lab is an interactive tool um, which allows you to sort of explore the uh, data that you have. There's not likely to be a lot of questions. There might be a question um, about when you would use Cloud Data Prep versus Cloud Data Lab. So just kind of keep that in mind. Also, um, you want to understand like uh, the way developers work uh, in the sense of you know people often write you know pieces of code. They want to be able to check that in somewhere so that colleagues can collaborate. You would use something like the cloud, cloud source repository, um, which is like a GitHub repository. And there are other services like uh, Builder for building containers automatically, and Deployment Manager for releasing those. So again, you don't need to know a lot of the details about those, uh, but you need to understand where they fit in sort of the development life cycle. OK. Um, the next piece, what I want to do, is now look at some example questions and how to analyze them. Uh, but before I do that, uh, I see I've been talking for quite a while, so I, I just want to kind of open it up if there are any questions um, people want to ask. Uh, I'm not going to jump to the, um, the site where we're collecting questions, so if somebody would like to ask questions, it is. There's been a lot of discussion in the chat, a lot of, uh, a lot of oh, okay, discussion. Great. Let's see if... Uh, um, and I'll tell you what, there's, there's quite a few people. Was that Linda? Plus, we have lots of uh, questions in our Q&A uh, webs. So, I hope so we can take Here, I'll stop sharing and jump back in here so I can talk to everybody. Okay. Yeah, one, uh, yeah, one question was about uh, Kubernetes, is, uh, and, uh, and the, the question, question was, was how necessary is it to know Kubernetes? Kubernetes. Um, I'm, there's, a, there's, a, there's a big discussion here. Um, maybe in a general sense, you can talk about <laughs> Kubernetes, why you would use it, maybe, maybe why you wouldn't use it. Does anyone, anyone else have an input there? <laughs> Okay. Um, yes. yes. Uh, can, do you really need to know Kubernetes? Absolutely. Um, Kubernetes is really important. That's foundational service. Um, many of us came to GCP, and um, this is before, uh, and worked with virtual machines. And so Compute Engine was our go-to place. 
more and more um, sort of the tech world is shifting from virtual machine-based to container-based deployments. Um, and, and so Kubernetes was actually developed by Google. They, they created Kubernetes because they needed to be able to manage all of their containers. Right? They shifted away from virtual machines to containers because containers is more efficient. They, they were able to basically get more out of their hardware. And now more and more of the world is sort of seeing that advantage and moving towards Kubernetes or moving towards containers. Now, if you have just a handful of containers, half a dozen containers, that's fairly easy to manage. But when you have a large number of containers, say hundreds of containers that might have, uh, like hundreds of different containers, all running, and you might have multiple instances of those containers are running, it's very hard to manage those individually uh, and manually. And that's where Kubernetes comes in. Kubernetes is... Um, is what's called an orchestration platform. So it understands containers, and it also understands things like um, compute and storage resources. It is really good at figuring out uh, where to run a particular container on a cluster to, in order to optimize the use of all the hardware resources. So um, I think more and more people will go to, to containers and Google is also making containers easier to use with things like Cloud Run um, and also Anthos. The Anthos platform basically allows you to run Kubernetes anywhere. You could run a Kubernetes cluster in Google in AWS. You could run it on-premise. And Anthos would allow to uh, manage all of those different clusters. There's a, There's a question, question about... So the, that's what I mean by... Yep. There's a question about the command line, and I think this is related to testing. Do you, um, do you need to learn the command line uh, for the Kubernetes? Or, well, actually, what do you mean when you say... I'm asking the question person. Um, do we need to learn the command line for those services? Does that mean the, the Kubernetes uh, command line? Or uh, I'm not sure what the question is specifically, but I wanted to throw that out there. Maybe uh, pop open your mic and let us know what you mean if you can. Uh, yeah, so the question was regarding flow and uh, data proc service. Hmm. Um, I was just wondering whether you need to know how to utilize the command line to uh, spin up the services because usually, uh, I mean, I've, I'm used to the GUI. I just don't know whether the exam requires it or not. That's, that was the question. Sorry about that. Oh, okay, yeah. Good no, question. that's a great question. Yep. I'm glad, uh, glad you brought that up. Yes, you really need to understand um, the command line as well as the GUI. And uh, if it's all right, I'll dive into this a little deeper because there are multiple command line tools. Um, with regards to Kubernetes, there are two distinct, there are basically two ways to work with Kubernetes. There's the G Cloud container command. So uh, G Cloud is sort of the, the standard command line for working with most of Google services. And the way it's heard, or the way the commands are structured, they, when you're typing the command in, it always starts with G Cloud, and then some indicator for service. Um, originally, Kubernetes engine was called engine. So in the command line, you would uh, um, originally call container. Command line still refers to it as container. So you would have something like G Cloud container, and then you would have the commands for, say, starting up a cluster or creating a cluster. You do need to know how to do that. Um, generally, the way the G Cloud command is structured is G Cloud, the name of the service, um, some kind of resource, a virtual machine or a cluster, um, some kind of, and then an operation on it, like create or delete, and then there's a bunch of parameters. So you do need to understand that, and I would suggest practicing, say, like spinning up virtual machines. Um, probably the, the command lines you need to know the most about are um, a G Cloud for spinning up virtual machines, um, also for working with Kubernetes, so G Cloud container commands. And also with Kubernetes, you need to understand there is also there is another command line called Kube Control, K-U-B-E-C-T-L. That is the command line utility for manipulating resources within the Kubernetes framework. So things like pods, if you've heard about pods and Kubernetes, 
If you wanted to adjust a pod or do an operation on a pod, you use cube control. So it's really important to understand the difference between G Cloud container and when you would use that and cube control commands. And again, the difference is G Cloud container is for manipulating the cluster. It's like for starting up clusters and maybe adding resources to clusters. When you're actually in the Kubernetes framework, you use cube control. So, and one way to think about it is, imagine this cluster was running either in premises or in AWS. Well, you can't use G Cloud in AWS. So is this something that makes sense to mm -hmm. manipulate a Kubernetes cluster and if, uh, in AWS? And if it does, then that means you're working like you're manipulating a pod. That means cube control is the thing you would use. So that's G Cloud and Kubernetes. Two other command lines uh, you need to be aware of are gsutil um, and then util. That is the command line for working with cloud storage. So if you want to create a bucket, you want to copy a local file up to cloud storage, you would use gsutil. If you're working with BigQuery, there is a command line called b, and bq is where you could do things like manipulate data sets, run a specify a SQL query to run. So you want to understand G Cloud for most things, GSUtil for working with um, cloud storage, BQ for working with BigQuery, and Q for the internals when you're actually manipulating Kubernetes objects. So another command line called CBT, which is used with Bigtable, that's going away. I believe you can now do some Bigtable commands in G Cloud. I doubt there's still a question on CBT, but if it shows up, CBT refers to Bigtable. Um, so there, that, that's my long-winded answer to the, no, that's, the command line. That's very good. That's really good. I think command line is something that uh, I just think that's, think that's an important thing to bring up, right, because that'll be expected. Um, um, I, I need, need to, to uh, quickly, quickly apologize, apologize to everyone because we have so many questions many coming in from different places. places and, and for me, what's, what's been, been most visible is the Google Meet chat. chat. However, um, I'm looking right now and I'm just seeing a lot of great questions also, uh, in, in the link that we shared, um, which is how we're supposed to do it, but I messed up a little bit here. So um, uh, do you want to continue with, uh, with your format? Um, because there's, uh, and then when we come back, I have a lot more questions, or do you want to go do some more questions now? Um, how about if we do, if people don't mind, uh, we'll do some more questions now, and then into um, basically how to, how to pick apart a question. So I would like to spend a little time on that and make sure we have time for that, but I also, mostly I want to make sure all of, as many of the questions get answered as possible. So yeah, how about if we do two, three more questions? Okay, that's great. So everyone who's uh, participating and watching, I'm going to jump into um, the silo where a lot of you have uh, put some questions. And um, let's see. Just... Yeah, all the questions, please post them in the uh, uh, Slido uh, website. Slido. That it's, uh, right. yep. uh, and you can upload the questions that you, uh, they are getting so, so here's a good one this one's been upvoted uh how uh let's see uh how do you get to a dan sullivan presentation material uh i'll i'll, I'll give you that one and then, then i'm going to go look for a more technical question i am happy to share these um chatter lydic can i send you like the pdf with all of my slides um after and then you can yes. sure thing. Yep. Folks. We'll, okay, we'll, yeah. Yeah. and uh, we can uh, start with the chat can we start with the questions in order from the top to the uh, because they are both the ones that are both oh i see linda thank uh, you you're right yeah and so the number one question from karen is uh if the main aim is professional cloud architect would you recommend to clear, to clear associate, associate cloud, cloud engineer, engineer first. first. Yeah, um, I don't have strong feelings one way or the other, and this is the reason. I would say, in general, it's good to know the material for cloud engineer. Um, for cloud engineer, you need to know more specifics about like command line. Um, so for example, you might be have a question about um, what parameter to use in a particular G Cloud command. That'll show up in the associate 
cloud engineer exam. Um, you wouldn't see that in the architect exam. So, um, yeah, I would I would recommend um, doing the associate cloud engineer. Like if, if you have the time and you have the resources to do it, then yes, I would say do that. That'll get you in the mindset of like understanding how Google thinks about cloud and resources and architecture. And none of the things that you learn will be wasted or unnecessary from an architecture perspective. Um, but you not get the level of detail at like command line questions. And the architecture exam, it's very conceptual. It's like, okay, you, you know, you're, you're a, a consultant and your client has this set up, you know, which storage system would you use and why would you, you know, and you have to figure out why and how to choose between them. So, um, I'd say yes, but also if you want to jump straight to the architect, that's fine too. But I would say uh, just also know like the G Cloud commands and things like that. That's a great, that's a great question. question. Yep. yep. Um, so yeah, the, uh, another, another one, one here, here is, uh, uh, and we're going to hold you to this. We want an exact answer. answer. Um, <laughs> you have to pick. You have to pick your date <laughs> format. But the question is, what is the ideal preparation time? Uh, number, number of weeks, of weeks you suggest? suggest for ACE exam, exam considering they uh, completed, completed architecture, architecture with, with Google, Google Compute Engine, Engine specialization. specialization. I can repeat that question. Uh, the co yeah. Sure, that's, I assume that's the Coursera course. Um, I would say, uh, I would give it about four weeks, assuming you're doing hands-on stuff, like you're done, like forget the books, forget the, I mean, not forget them, but you know. Four weeks, like hands-on stuff, you're, you know, every other day you're in the console or you're firing up the console shell and you're working with gcloud commands and you're spinning stuff up and working with things and breaking things. And you are following the exam guide, like work through the exam guide. That, that's one way to do it is to start it, you know, number one and work your way through and make sure you can you understand some of those things. And also go through the... Um, uh, like, like practice, practice tests, tests. Uh, that's another thing, just to, again, because the test is like an artificial environment. So I would say four weeks, a lot of hands-on stuff. Take the, um, the practice test that Google provides. There's practice tests associated with the book. There's a practice test with the online course. Um, I know some other people have, uh, um, like, practice tests on Udemy. I've I've never seen them. I don't know what they are, but that might be another source. Um, so, yeah, I would say concentrate on those things. Hands on, go through the exam guide, and uh, practice with questions, taking the test. Yeah. And, Dan, and Dan, you were right. That question was uh, in, in relation to the Coursera course, so exactly right. Oh, okay. Good. Yep. Uh, yeah, good. Yeah, yep. I've, I've personally taken a few of those, so I can recommend. My experience with those was okay. I, it, actually, it really uh, opened my eyes to spinning up, you know, some of the App Engine or the virtual machine environments. You know, just doing the Coursera courses sort of forces you to do a little bit of, um, of App Engine work. So that's fun. All right. Let's see. Another question is, Dan, do the um, GCP exams use computerized adaptive testing technology, like for uh, example, CISSP does. Now, I, I don't know anything about this, so maybe if you recognize these acronyms, you can explain those first and then uh, answer the question. Yeah, um, I vaguely understand. I'm not much on pedagogy and testing, like from a formal professional perspective, but the idea of adaptive testing is that, you know, do the Set, the set of questions change based on the responses questions. So, you know, if you look like you might not understand a, a domain, might ask more questions than that, just to probe to make sure, or, yeah, you really don't or you do. I have no idea um, what Google uses. Yeah, I don't know. I would, yeah, I don't know. I didn't want to venture a guess. Um, just, just to be completely transparent, um, yeah, again, I don't have a formal relationship. I've worked with folks from Google who are involved in the testing, but that was like when I'm writing the books and there are people who are um, experts who are reviewing the content, like technical reviews. Um, you know, there's probably like a dozen Google experts that review every book. Um, and then I will chat with some of the people who do the testing, but I, I really don't have any insight 
into like that's a great question and i have no idea what the answer is yeah that's great yeah so um uh let us know if anyone finds out we'll we'll share that information yeah yep um let's see here um I'm still sticking to the, the side low questions. Uh, please use that link and add questions there. I do see people are chatting, and that's great. So keep talking, but I'm going to keep going to the side low uh, for questions. Here's another one. Um, since cloud is a moving target, how often do these exams get updated to include new services? Now, let me before you answer that, let me give you a little bit of my personal experience with Coursera, where I was literally in the middle of a Coursera course and the technology changed. And um, it, was a little, it was a little painful because I was almost at the end and then I needed to uh, sort of redo many of the, the uh, exercises because, and, it, and truthfully it was an improvement. Um, the way that I was spinning up the, <clears throat> the testing environment and all that wasn't so hot. But then they sort of uh, came down to their final solution for how Coursera was going to use GCP to spin up the virtual environment in which I was going to do some things, right? And then the virtual environment would tell me, yes, you did complete that correctly and, and move on, all that fun stuff. So that's a great question, right? Because uh, most of this is about what, what, what did you do for me lately, right? What, what happened yesterday? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, no, this, again, this is just an excellent question. And I, I can only give you my best guess, um, which is that the exams are updated, um, possibly with new questions on an unknown basis constantly being updated, almost like software. You know, you're constantly rolling out new features. I suspect they are that Google is constantly testing questions. So 50 questions, maybe one or two that you're not actually graded on because it's a test. They're, Google's basically just testing it out and seeing how well it, it works. Um, so I generally assume that there are questions like that in there. And I assume that anything that is no longer in beta is fair game for a test question. So for example, yeah, I don't know what's in beta anymore. I mean, a bunch of things came out of beta. Um, like in cloud BigQuery, just recently Google announced that um, you can do low level, uh, table level access controls on, on uh, tables in BigQuery. And that's big because before you have to do it at the data school, which is a higher level. Um, so I would expect in an architecture um, test or an ACE test, there might be a question on access control and security in BigQuery that would have asked about that before, but now that the table level controls are there, those questions are going to get pulled. I would, I would suspect questions like that um, are pulled immediately. I don't know how quickly they're going to roll out questions about things like Cloud Run um, or Anthos. So my, the way I prepare for it is I just, you know, check and see if this is in beta, and if it is beta or alpha, then I don't need to worry about it general production, then yes, I need to assume that it could be on the test. Right, right that's, that's fair, fair right? right? Yep. So, so here's, here's uh, a, maybe this is a yes or no question. question. Does, does Google, uh, does GCP provide a 50% discount to next exams you take once you've passed one? Um, so this is, there, there, this is a question about AD, AWS does this cool thing, does Google do this cool yep. thing also? Um, I think I've gotten emails, like after taking the exam, an email with an offer. So I think they have done that in the past, like an ad hoc way. I don't think it's standardized. Like I've always paid full yeah. price for the exams. Okay. Um, so you make it, yeah, I think the answer is no, no. in general. Okay. Yep, that makes sense. And so you know, look for specials yeah, or look for deals, but there's definitely not a, not a breadcrumb type of, if you get this one, the next one's half off, you know. Yeah. Right. Right. Great. Great, so, so let's yeah. keep going here. Let's see, the next one then is, this, um, there's a lot of, there's a couple of questions about the ordering, right, of what should I take first? And we already had one of those. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read out loud two questions, and then maybe you can address it on, on the, you know, a higher level. So uh, the first one is, how different are the certification exams for professional cloud architect versus associate cloud engineer? 
That's the more to the other question, right? What's what's the difference between these two? And then, you know, also uh, similar to that is, oh gosh, these are moving, man. People are getting active in here. Um, it was a similar question to what should I do first? I, I think the basic question is, if I'm new to this, what's the, what should I start out with? Well, absolutely, no question. If you're new to start with the cloud engineer, associate cloud engineer, the professional programs are designed for people who have at least three years of experience in Google Cloud. That's sort of the level they are testing at. Um, so it's really in depth that the architect hard, I will say that. I mean, and they're all really hard. I mean, in different ways, the cloud engineer, the architect exam is hard because it requires so much judgment because you're going to be deciding, um, you know, how do, how do you partition these large databases so that you avoid hot spotting, like, um, like, like for an architect exam or the data engineer, for example, you need to know how big table is structured. The way Bigtable works is there is a cluster of virtual machines that manage metadata and the, about the data, and the data in your Bigtable is actually stored on Colossus, the file system, and they're written in blocks called, uh, they used to be uh, SST tables. And, and so you need to be able to reason through, all right, how are these things um, stored? Because the way I structure the key determines which, which uh, yeah, which block, is going to be all of my keys are say sequential, then I'm going to get a hot spot because um, I'm going to be constantly writing to the same block. So that's the that's the kind of thing you think about in a data engineer or um, the architect exam. Um, that's from a data store perspective. Um, you might also be thinking about um, oh, uh, you have a legacy. Hadoop cluster that runs pig job. Pig is a, a language in Hadoop. Um, and you want to migrate to the cloud. Which service would you use? Uh, you know, what, and which data set would you migrate? How would you, um, what would you do instead of using HDFS, Hadoop file system, which you might use local, what would you use in Google? And it would be, well, we'll, we'll map HDFS to cloud storage and use it that way. And, and so if you re really know the details, like from an architecture level, like what are the options for things like, you know, creating clusters and understanding Hadoop and understanding how how things from like Hadoop map to Dataproc or how, say, Kafka, which is another um, messaging broker kind of system, how does how does that compare to Cloud Pub stuff? You really need to understand at that level and be comfortable reasoning about design choices. If you're comfortable with that, then Cloud Architect's a good way to go. That's great. I don't know if that's helpful. Any feedback is great. Yeah, if this is not clear, please let me know. Yeah, so we have the questions in, in the side low, but if uh, you know, people feel free to keep chattering about this in chat if you want to expand the conversation. Um, you mentioned, here's another question. You'd mentioned this before, and um, I, I need some education here because I don't know what Athos is. Uh, but the question is, and, you know, I experienced a little bit of this, so I can tell you maybe frequently, but when is the last time the questions in the test were revised? I'm sure this isn't, a, this isn't for the purposes of cheating, I'm sure. Um, and, <laughs> and is Athos included? Yep, I do not know uh, the answer to either of those. And so, again, I would say, um, my feeling is for the... Regards to the questions, and we never know what's going to be on there. So I would suggest don't worry about the question structure or how frequently things change, assuming like it's a static thing. You might take the test the same day I take the test, and we get completely different sets of questions. So um, it's more a question of, yeah, be comfortable with, you know, Anthos. And the Anthos is it's like a hybrid cloud service. And it allows you to manage Kubernetes cluster pretty much anywhere. You could have a Kubernetes cluster running in GKE, in your on-premise, and you can manage all of them from Anthos. And the reason that's important is you to move workloads around um, to, to use the most efficient workload that, you know, you really want to keep it on-premise. 
um, because it needs access to data that's in a mainframe and you just want to run there. You can manage that from Anthos and Anthos is running in Google Cloud. Um, so you have one point of management. That's the key thing to know about Anthos. Um, yeah, I, other than that, I don't know what kind of questions might show up for Anthos, but I would be familiar with it, like at an architectural level. I, I don't even know, I haven't looked at it yet, so I don't know what like G Cloud commands are for Anthos, but I would, I would definitely look into that. Um, so I would read the concepts guide, like go into the Anthos documentation, read the concept guide, take a quick look at getting started, um, and then just understand what Anthos is used for. I think if you do that, um, you're probably going to be in pretty good shape. Anthos is super, super complicated, so I don't think um, Google would expect anybody at an associate cloud engineer to, to drill into anything below that kind of superficial level. All right, that's great. And again, it's quick to get. Yep. So I have another question. Uh, how are you feeling about that? Do you want to keep with questions or? Um... Sure, you want to do one more and then we'll, we'll look actually look at some questions because I think one of the um, key things about passing the exam is really being comfortable at reading questions and understanding how to pick them apart. So, yeah, that's, um, okay. Yeah. So, so this, this last question, um, and, and uh, maybe I'll give a little uh, a pre preface here. Um, we're talking about the, the Google Cloud Platform, right? Uh, what gets a lot of attention is Firebase, right? And they're similar, uh, they're different. I think, you know, Firebase is underneath Google Cloud Platform. Um, the question is, what is the difference between Firebase and um, oh, got Fire Cloud Storage, right? Yep. yep. Okay. Yep. And I, yeah. I'm going to throw this. I'd like to throw this extra question in there, which is, what uh, is Firebase really a consideration in these GCP tests? For me, it felt more like, and you can tell me I'm wrong here. For me, it felt more like Firebase was the way that you got to learn this stuff in a safer, less scary environment. And then, then you were opened up, the big doors were opened up, and, and Google Cloud Platform was there. Very similar, but a little bit more complex than Firebase, right? Uh, but what's, what's your story there? And, and how important is Firebase? Certainly, it's important to know difference between Firebase, Fire Cloud Storage. Um, but, you know, uh, how much time should you spend in the Firebase world uh, in preparation for these? Okay. Um, so, first of all, Firebase uh, came to Google Cloud as an acquisition. That was a third-party um, company. And Firebase is really designed for supporting mobile applications or any kind of application where there's going to be, like, a lot of, a large number of connections trying to connect to the back end um, and where you might need to do synchronizing data between say a mobile device and a storage system uh, in in Google Cloud. So in general, if you're working with a mobile device, large number of users trying to connect, you've got to be able to see data, that's a Firebase use case. Cloud Firestore um, is now part of Cloud Data Store, and I may get the terminology wrong because I'm not exactly sure how Google is branding it. I think it is still Cloud Data Store. Cloud Data Store is used for traditional, like a uh, if you have a web application and you need a uh, semi-structured database, NoSQL database using a document kind of structure, Cloud Data Store is the service to use. When you create a cloud data store database, you're going to have to pick a mode. And there's cloud data store mode and cloud fire store mode. And generally, if you're seeing, um, have like a, like a typical back end, you're going to do some updates, push some data back and forth, um, you want, you would probably use cloud data store mode. Cloud fire store is if you have, again, like more connections, you're going to have a lot of like lightweight connections trying to connect, Firestore would be the better option. I would say you want to know some G Cloud commands for manipulating Cloud Data Store. You want to understand that Cloud Data Store is a document model database. It's, it does not use SQL. So if there's a question that says, oh, you need to deploy a database that uses SQL, if Cloud Data Store is one of the options, you can immediately throw it out. So. Um, the query language in Cloud Data Store is called GL, um, but it's not SQL. And um, yeah, I think 
be familiar. I think if you know that um, and know that it's not relational, it's a managed service, um, yeah, I'd say that's probably enough. I would say, yeah, maybe, you know, understand, go, go in and play with it in the console, create a, create a database, insert some data, um, create some secondary indexes. Oh, I'd say probably know about secondary indexes um, because uh, also know that when you create a cloud data store database and you create a, um, if you create an entity, um, whenever you create it, that entity, it, it will, cloud data store will automatically like all of the attributes. You want to have an index on combination of attributes, create a secondary index uh, on your own. Um, but I know the terms kinds and entities, um, and those kinds tend to are analogous to a table in relational parlance, and entities are like rows in a table. So I would say know that about Cloud Data Store. Wow, that's, that, was that was a great, great amount, amount of information of there because that the, 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 the branding, as you were saying, um, okay. doesn't necessarily help okay. uh, clarify, but your information sure did. So, so I guess, I guess we'll, we'll uh, why don't you uh, take, take back, back over, over and um, okay. and uh, we'll jump in yeah. this time. Okay. All right, let's uh, share the screen change. And everyone, everyone, thank you so, so much for participating, participating in the, the, the silo um uh, questions. Uh, questions that was that was really great linda that was a, a neat find i haven't seen this before it's kind of nice how people can throw questions in and just upvote questions um it's uh this is cool google was using it in a one of our meetings so i stole it i stole the idea from them good good work on it. yeah good good thiefing there thank you Uh, let's see. Uh, I believe I'm chair. Okay. Um, I just want to spend a little bit of time now looking at some of the questions on the practice exam and just talk a little bit about like how I pick them apart. Um, and this is part of the exam taking strategy. Oops. Um, so this is a question I pulled um, off of the, the practice exam. And what you'll notice here, uh, this is very similar to the layout um, that you'll see in the actual exam. So we have a scenario question. Basically, so you have a project um, as all of its compute engine resources are in the Europe West 1 region. You want to set up Europe West 1 as the default region for gcloud commands. What should you do? Okay, so clearly, okay, we're talking about regions. We're talking about defaults. We're talking about gcloud. And now I want to look at, like, the four different options. All right, so A is use shell, cloud shell instead of command line in interface for your device, launch Cloud Shell, navigate to a different resource. Already I'm wondering, like, why would I use Cloud Shell instead of command line interface? Because Cloud Shell um, is basically, it's like an easy access to a command line um, rather than running the command line interface in your on your local machine. So basically, they really should be the same. Anything you can do in Cloud Shell, you can do in command line on your machine and vice versa. So this, right away, and then option B is use, okay, G Cloud Config, set compute region, West 1. Um, C is use Cloud Config, uh, compute zone, Europe West 1. Okay, so that's interesting. So here are two options. And the only difference is one is slash region and one is slash zone. So I'm going to keep that in mind. Um, and then the third one is create a VPN from on-premise to a subnet. So, oh, wait a minute. Okay, now we're getting into networking. What, that has nothing to to do with default regions with G Cloud command. So I'm going to throw that one out. So I've basically thrown out A and D. And now I want to kind of narrow it down. It's like, all right, so I clearly it's a, one of these G Cloud commands. And the question is, is it a region thing or a zone thing? Well, in the question, it references you want to navigate, um, you want the Europe West 1 region to be the default. Um, so the correct answer is B. Um, you want to be able to use the region one. So, you know, that was sort of an easy path to start off with, but I just want to um, show you how to pick that one apart. And if people have questions as we're going through through these questions, you know, feel free to um, just chime right in. Um, here's one where we're talking about App Engine, and you want to develop a new App Engine, and you're ready to deploy it to production. You need to estimate the cost of running your application on 
Google Cloud Platform as accurately as possible. Okay, anytime I see cost in a question, um, I immediately think of things like the pricing calculator, um, alerts on budgets, and things like that. So let's see what we have here for options. We can create a YAML file with the expected usage, pass the file to G Cloud Estimate. You know, that doesn't sound right. I don't, you know, if there is a G Cloud App Estimate, why? The YAML file doesn't sound right. So this, yeah, that, that just doesn't, that's one of those questions that just doesn't sound right. Um, let's see, we can multiply the cost of the application when it was in development by the number of expected users to get an accurate estimation. Um, well, no, because I mean, that, that not, uh, equates number of users with what I'm doing development, and it may not be, there might be, not be a linear relationship at all. So that doesn't really make sense. Use the pricing calculator for App Engine to get an accurate estimate of the expected charges. Okay, that's definitely the best so far. Um, create a ticket with Google Cloud billing support to get an accurate estimate. Okay, no. Anytime there's there's an option where it's like, you know, email Google, create a ticket with Google, that's really not the, the right answer unless it is about um, uh, you've hit a default limit and you want to increase it. Um, so, for example, there's like a, a maximum number of GKE clusters you can create. If you want to create more than that, that that's the one time we're contacting Google. But anything like trying to get a submit or something like that, it's relevant. So here the correct answer is C. And here's another one. Your company processes high volume of IoT data, so Internet of Things data that are timestamped. Okay, so we're working with time series data. Um, whenever I hear time series, I think, okay, um, lots of data, high volume of data, uh, a large volume of data at high velocity, um, but it's very structured as well. Um, so it's the same attributes that come in, and there's always a timestamp. And the total volumes can be several petabytes. And so right away, we're not going to talk about uh, cloud SQL. Um, almost certainly this is not going to be a cloud data store option. Um, at petabyte scale, I'm thinking it's either, right away I can think, okay, it's query, table, cloud spanner. All right? Um, data needs to be written and changed at a high speed. Um, I can still ingest that that means we're probably not going to be using BigQuery because we're not going to be changing um, data you want the most performance storage option for your data to choose. Um, well, it's time stamped, um, high volume, high speed. That's not a good option. It's possibly you could use Cloud Spanner, but it's really not a good fit. And oh wait, Cloud Spanner is not, so that's not it. So I've already eliminated Cloud Data Store. Cloud Storage, you know, it's, it's an option for storing petabytes of data. But it's not a great option for writing at very high speeds. Um, and it's not going to be BigQuery because we're not going to be updating. So in this case, um, Bigtable seems like a, a, and really, anytime you see IoT and you want to store IoT data, it's really Bigtable is almost always going to be the right answer in that case. Uh, let's see. Here we have, you have a definition for an instance template. Um, and are people familiar with like what an uh, instant template is? And if not, I can go into that. Um, an instant template that contains a web application. You're asked to deploy the application so that it can scale based on the HTTP traffic it receives. So what do you do? So this is probably the closest thing to an architect level question you would get. This would be the bare minimum. This would be the simplest architecture question you would ever get on the architect exam. So I have an instant template. I could create an a VM from the instant template, okay, that sounds reasonable. Create an image from the VM disk, export the image to cloud storage, create an HTTP load balancer and add a cloud storage bucket as its backend service. It's like, okay, well, all right, yeah, yeah, we probably want a load balancer, that, that seems reasonable, but there's a lot of steps here. Um, you could also create a VM instance from the template, create an app engine, I'm sorry, create an app engine application in automatic scaling mode that forwards all traffic to the VM. Um, no, why would we, yeah, see, if you're creating an application in Compute Engine, why would you then create something in App Engine just to route traffic to it? So that that doesn't make any sense. That's, there are too many moving parts with that. It just, yeah, 
Yeah, I'm immediately going to throw out B. Um, option C is you can create a managed instance group based on the instant template, configure auto scaling based on HTTP traffic, and configure the instance group as the backend service of an HTTP load balancer. Okay, that's all very logical. That makes sense because uh, we want this uh, group to scale up and up and down based on HTTP traffic. So that's a good use case for a managed instance group. And also, um, since we're working from a template, that means all of the VMs running in this instance group are the same. So that means we can use a managed instance group. And we know we want a load balancer. Um, so C seems like a good option so far. Um, but let's check out D. Create the necessary amount of instances required for peak user traffic based on the instance template. Okay, right away that's wrong. One of the advantages of going to the cloud is that we have we can vary the amount of resources allocate based on our. So why would we create um, a number of instances based on peak traffic? Because most of that would be idle, or you know, it's at some point in time, or most of the time, at least some of those resources would be idle. So that's not very efficient. Um, so let's throw out D. Um, so we've thrown out B, we've thrown out D, we're left with A and B. Um, a, there's a lot of work like creating custom image in the VM, exporting to cloud storage. There's a lot of extra steps. Whereas C is the most automated way to read a, you're using a managed script. So in this case, the correct answer is C. Okay. Um, I'll do one more. People will want we can we can either continue with this, is, or we can go back to the questions. Whichever is more useful for for, for you. Um, here we go. You're a large international audience. Uh, well, let me. I'll, I'll jump, jump in. in. I'll, I'll say, say that there's, there's been, been a lot, a lot of, activity of activity in the questions. The questions. Um, um, if, if folks could, could go, go ahead and, and do upvoting, that would be really great. And, and then and when, when uh, add, add your questions, questions or upvote, upvote the yeah, questions, questions that are in there, and then when it's time to come into the questions, we'll have some um, uh, newly prioritized stuff to talk about. Great. Thank you. That, that was a good idea. Okay, so here we're winning an option, large international audience for running stateless virtual machines. Okay, so we're working with VMs, not containers. Oh, within a managed instance group across multiple locations. Okay, so we've got that one architected. Um, one feature of the application lets users upload files and share them with other users. Okay, files must be available for 30 days. After that, they're removed from the system entirely. Which storage solution would you choose? Ah, that makes me think of uh, the, uh, they're removed after 30 days. That makes me think of uh, data lifecycle management which is the thing I couldn't think of earlier, which is part of cloud storage. Within cloud storage, you can create policies on buckets and say, okay, um, after 30 days, delete these, delete the files in here or move them to mirror line storage or cold line storage and do that automatically. So you set a policy, cloud storage will manage it for you. So let's see what our, our options are. We can go with a cloud data storage database well, we just talked about cloud, and that's document model with uh, semi-structure. We're loading up a lot to load arbitrary files. Since you know, we don't store files, whether it's cloud or or all or cloud data files, simple cloud store. Or uh, B, use a multi-regional cloud storage bucket. Okay, that makes sense. What that does, uh, by multi-regional, that means um, when I put a file up there, it'll get replicated across multiple regions. So that'll that'll help me with my large and international audience um, because I'll have copies across multiple regions. We'll get some pretty good um, latency um, from there. And because it's cloud storage bucket, I can use lifecycle policies to take care of this 30-day, um, delete the files after 30-day requirement. So I'm liking B. B looks pretty good. Uh, we could use persistent SSDs on virtual machine instances. We do that. Um, but SSDs are really expensive. And um, 
because it would be stored on SSDs, we would either have to um, manage replication ourselves to virtual machine instances in other regions so that we get that high performance for our international audience. Um, so that's that, already so that that doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, it's expense more work than using a storage. That doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, it's expense more work than using a storage bucket. So I'm going to eliminate option C. And then finally, uh, a managed instance group of file store servers. Okay, file store is a server that gives you like a, a network file system, NSF file system. So you're not managing instance file group. So this is one of those uh, options where the semantics like. It makes sense. You don't manage instance group of file store servers, so we'll throw D out. So in this case, the obvious answer is, is B. Uh, so anyway, so that, those are examples of how to pick apart um, questions. And um, so right now, I'll, I'll and um, we'll uh, take some questions, if that sounds good for everybody else. Linda, Linda, you were you saying, saying we're, uh, we, Linda, did you, did you have a concern about time? Because we do have questions. Um, I just don't want to, uh, don't want to go over. And Dan, how are you feeling? Dan, how are you feeling with the time? Did you finish all the slides uh, or uh, do you still have slides? Uh, I have some more slides to go over, but really I want to, I really want to tailor this to what people are interested in. And I am happy to share the slides. Um, I've got a bunch of slides. I will, um, Maybe if there's a way before the end of the meeting, I'll I'll make PDF, PDFs of all of my slide decks, and I'll. Um, I think I have your slides. You send it to me before the event. Do you remember? I can send it to everybody. I will put it in a drive, and I will send the link to all. Oh, okay, great. And I'll send you an, another one that I just uh, I made after I sent those. So. Okay, perfect. Great. Okay, great. That's perfect. Thank you. Okay, so okay, I'm, yeah, I'm, so I'm happy to do. Whatever. Yeah, yeah, so I'm, I'm looking, looking at some of the questions, questions here. here. Um, one, um, of one of the advantages, advantages of, of being the host is, is that I can, I can prioritize my question, <laughs> even if, maybe if it's not <laughs> at the top of the list. So I'm scrolling way down because I posted a question, and um, and actually, wow, folks, you have added so many good questions here. Um, so <laughs> that's great. There are people saying that they would prefer over the slides a little bit, and after go. What do you think? I don't know. I see people suggesting to go with the slides. Then what do you think? Okay. So, uh, here's, here's one that I thought was really useful. Um, is, is there any graphic or pick that describes the differentiation of each GCP service? So I've kind of wished for this, and I know Google offers so much stuff, right, that it's really hard to understand where's the top, you know, you when do you come, come down, down to the next, next level, level of stuff? stuff. You, know, you know, what, what service is underneath what yep. service? Um, so so I, yep. I think people really want to learn how to answer, answer questions, questions. Um, but, but maybe, maybe this high level, level um, to, uh, uh, maybe, maybe you, you can, can answer, answer this high level, level question about, about um, if, if I'm, I'm trying to learn this stuff, is there a graphic, is there a chart, EDR type thing that I can look at that really gives me a conceptual image of how all the Google services work together? Um, I will say, I don't think there is a single one, but there's a bunch of them. And I think I've got an example here. Where is it? Of a flow chart. Here we go. There are flow charts. Um, if you um, go to Google and uh, Google and, and search for um, Google Cloud flow chart, you will see this. I'll see if I can. Uh, yeah, we already have the, the link. Yeah, those, this is the best I have found in terms of anything like what you just described. Um, and these are uh, sort of like decision trees, like how do you choose which data store? Um, boy, that's a great question. Um, sounds like I should, I should make one of those. Um, Oh boy, good luck yeah. with that. I mean, that's that's, that's actually, actually one of the trickier, trickier things yeah. for me. Uh, for, me uh, for, for me, coming, coming into the Google, Google products, I came into Firebase, Firebase. and that, that that's, that's a very user friendly sort of, sort of scenario. scenario. And, and I necessarily, necessarily I had to go into the the, the Google, Google Cloud, Cloud Platform, Platform Council, Council, and, and that, that was, was the, the the tab on the you know on the side. There are so many things that Google offers, and it was very hard to understand. 
you know, how these things relate because they just have a lot of stuff. And and I've also been in the Amazon Web Services space, and that's equally intimidating. <laughs> so, you know, the first person to get a, a good picture wins, I think. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, and... Uh, yeah, well, if I if I get around, if I can actually pull that off, I would love feedback. Um, I'll share it with you all, and uh, yeah, I'd love feedback on that because it sounds like that um, that would be really helpful. Uh, and I never thought of that, so uh, so thank you um, for all of you who who asked that question. That um, that's one of the great things. This this kind of um, interaction is really helpful for me because I you bring up things and, uh, that I do not think of, and I think that is a fantastic idea. Um, so I will try and work on that. Then I think the chat decision, everybody wants to go with your slides. Okay. I think everybody voted in there for the slides. Okay. So. <laughs> All right. Um, so here, so here's another one. Um, you're creating a Kubernetes engine cluster to deploy multiple pods inside a cluster. Um, all container logs must be stored in BigQuery for later analysis. You want to follow Google recommended practices. Okay. That's a phrase you all you watch out for. Um, because there are specific things. So if there are two answers that are both like reasonably correct or technically true, um, one of them will be the preferred Google option. So you just need to be aware of that. Um, which two approaches can you take? Okay. <clears throat> A couple of things I want to point out here. Um, notice the, the sort of the um, area here, the uh, checkbox is actually a square instead of a circle. So that's a visual cue that this is, um, you can make multiple choices. And if you're like me and you get like test anxiety and you let your test anxiety get the better of you, um, I have answered, you know, put checked off one answer that I know is right and then I blow off and go to the next thing. Um, and, I, and I easily get that one wrong if I don't like go back, check my answers and, and see that I made a mistake. So from a, a test strategy suggestion, watch for visual, excuse me, visual cues. Um, oftentimes the when you have multiple, you have to pick multiple options. There are five options, not just four. And the boxes are like that. And they spell it out for you. They say, which two options can you take? So so just, you know, um, I have to tell myself to slow down um, when I see things like this. So, okay, so, yeah, so we've got to do a couple of things. So we're working with Kubernetes Engine. We, we, we want to take those logs and we want to put them into BigQuery. So that means we're working with Kubernetes Engine, um, cloud logging, um, aka Stackdriver and BigQuery. So let's see, we're going to turn on Stackdriver logging during the Kubernetes cluster creation. Okay, that sounds reasonable. I'll keep that one in mind. Um, turn on Stackdriver monitoring during Kubernetes engine cluster creation. Well, monitoring is useful if I want to know like CPU utilization or set an alert if I'm going over like. Um, you know, if my memory utilization is a greater than 90% or something like that. And I don't see any requirements for that in the question. So I'm going to kind of leave B to the side. I don't think that that doesn't look like a likely candidate just, read, just yet. Uh, develop a custom add-on that uses Cloud API and BigQuery API. Okay, I'm not even going to read the rest. Why would Google make us write a custom add-on to do something as basic as move logs around? So i uh, I almost, I'm almost convinced that's not the right answer. So I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna come back to that unless I'm really desperate. Let's see. D. Use the Stackdriver logging export feature to create a sync to cloud storage. Create a cloud data flow job that imports the log from cloud storage to BigQuery. Uh, wait a minute. Now, I, even if I'm not familiar all that much with how to get logs into BigQuery, why would I have to create my own cloud? data flow job. I mean, maybe that's a possibility, um, but, I, but there's a lot of extra steps, like I'm exporting to cloud storage, um, then I'm creating a cloud data flow job and to get them into BigQuery. Maybe, but all right, I'll keep that one in mind. Uh, and option E is use the Stackdriver export feature to create a sync to BigQuery. Oh, that sounds good. Specify a filter expression to export logs related to your Kubernetes engine cluster only. Okay, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about filter expression. Um, do I want just Kubernetes cluster engine only? Uh, um, you're creating Kubernetes engine to deploy mobile pods. 
all container logs must be stored. Okay, all container logs. Okay, containers are tied to the engine. So, yep, okay, that makes sense. So I think the reasonable answers are turn on logging. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. I've got to be able to collect my logs. And I've got to be able to push them to BigQuery and create a link. Yep, I know logging. I'm familiar enough with logging to know they have the concept of a sync for putting the logging data. So that's how I get to those two, two answers. Um, okay, let's see what we have here. This one is about you have an application server running on Compute Engine. Okay, so I'm working with virtual machines, and it's in your West 1D zone. Okay, so I'm in a single zone. This is not at the regional level yet. You need to ensure high availability. Okay, yeah, so I've got I've to be in more than this zone. And replicate the server to the Europe West to C zone. Since I'm going to get to uh, another zone, Use steps possible. All right, what am I going to do? All right, I can create a snapshot from the disk. Okay, that's good because that gives me you know everything, and I'll create a disk from that snapshot in the Europe West Two C zone. Create a VM with that disk. Okay, yeah, that seems pretty reasonable. Um, create a snapshot from the disk. Create a disk from the snapshot in the Europe West One D zone, and then move that to Europe Two C and create a VM with that disk. Mm. That's, a, that's extra, like, you know, creating the snapshot and, you know, um, creating this right in the, where I want it to be makes more sense. Like, I have, well, B doesn't sound right, right? Um, use gcloud to copy the disk to Europe West to C zone, VM with that disk. No, I'm not going to just copy the disk. I mean, I've got to make a snapshot. I've got to have a snapshot, like a, a consistent um, view of the disk. Um, so I'm not just going to copy a disk. Um, so C disk is, is another one. Even if I'm not quite sure, that one doesn't look right. Um, use the gcloud instance move with parameter zone. Well, I've never heard of that. So I'm, instance move, I mean, that may be something. Um, but um, going back up, it looks like you know the least amount of work is just creating a snapshot and then just from the snapshot. So there the correct answer is A. All right. Oh, square boxes, and there's five. All right, this is probably a multiple choice, or you know, I have to choose multiple things. Yeah, I have uh, a question on the previous slide. I'm sorry. I have a question on the previous oh, slide. Oh, sure. I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, the new there is a new feature called machine images, right? Oh, I'm sorry. What is it called? There is a called machine images. Oh, okay. So. Is that the replacement of using the solution or is a new update from me? What is the difference between snapshot and creating a mission image? Uh, you know, I am not sure. I would have to look into that. Uh, this may be, yeah, this may be an example of an older question and it has been superseded by image. Um, so I don't know off the top of my head, but uh, if you want to connect in and ask me that, that question, I'll follow up with you on that one. Sure, sure, sure. Thank you. Uh, let's see. So, okay, I need to. I'm going to be picking two things, probably, maybe more. You need to select a transactional. Okay, uh, transactional. The ones that the a lot of the data services support transactional to some degree. There's different levels of SQL and Cloud Spanner. Are the like the richest transactions? Data Store has transactions. Big Table has not really transactions, but they have consistency. They're density consistency like a row level, maybe. That's it. Um, oh, relational data storage. Okay, well, the relational door data storage systems, well, that immediately eliminates cloud data store and Bigtable and BigQuery, because BigQuery uses SQL, but it's not related to um, Which two would you consider? Um, well, cloud SQL, little data storage system, Banner is the horribly scalable global relational data service. So I would pick B and C in this case. Uh, let's see. Oh, another Kubernetes question. Yeah, and you'll notice that there are, there are a number of questions on Kubernetes just because it is the word is. So you have a Kubernetes cluster with one node pool. Um, the node pool is 
set of nodes that are grouped identically. Um, and the cluster receives a lot of traffic and need to add a node. What should you do? Excuse me. Uh, Gcloud contains resize. Okay, Gcloud container. That's right. That's the command. Anything I do with Kubernetes engine is, um, and it's uh, manipulating uh, the Kubernetes elf with Gcloud would have the container word in it. So that's right. With a desired number of rows. Okay, that makes sense. You queue control container cluster resize. Oh, wait, cube control, the Kubernetes, like no pool, the cluster itself. So I don't think B is right. Uh, let's see, edit the managed instance group of the cluster. Oh, wait, no. Google uses managed instance groups to implement uh, Kubernetes clusters, and it manages them. So when you create a Kubernetes engine cluster, and say you have like five nodes, you can jump over into Compute Engine and take a look, and you're going to see five VMs spun up there. And it's got, and they've got some naming convention based on what Google does, and edit those things to manipulate the cluster. Um, so C does not make sense. And then D is edit the managed instance group. Oh, okay, again, editing the instance group. Okay, neither of those make any sense. So we have to, is it a command or a cube control command. Um, so again, I'm going to think about this. Uh, it's working at the cluster level. So, um, it's going to be the gcloud command. So that's how I kind of reason through that one. Let's see. You created an update for your application on App Engine. Okay, we're working with App Engine. You want to deploy the update without impacting users. Ah, what that means is I can't shut down my application and just let users hang out there. All right. You want to be able to roll back as quickly as possible if it fails. Okay. All right. Um, so I, I want to kind of, I'm doing this tentatively. I, I want to do this as carefully as possible. So what should you do? Um, okay. Delete the corruption of the application. Well, if I did that, my users would be disrupted and I would have to reinstall it if something went wrong. So right away, A doesn't look right. Um, and then deploy the updated version, updated, excuse me, deploy the update using the same version identifier as the deleted version. No, that doesn't make sense. That, is, that doesn't meet any of the requirements. So I'm pretty much gonna throw A out. Notify your users of an upcoming maintenance window. Well, there again, I'm disrupting them and I, I'm required to not impact the users. So B is immediately off the list. Uh, C, deploy the update as the same version that is currently running. Well, no, we don't want that. D, the update as a new version, migrate traffic from the current version to their version. Okay, so that looks more promising because that allows us um, to create a new version. So we still have our other one running. And with migrate traffic, we can slowly move over, say, maybe 5%, 10%, 20%. And that way, if we run into problems, we can redirect traffic back pretty quickly. So we don't have to reinstall that. So D is the correct answer there. Uh, then a question on the Canary deployments and blue-green deployments. Uh, we exam for them, blue-green deployments and Canary deployments. And also A and B testing. Uh, so, uh, will, will exam cover this 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 type of questions as well? Um, you, that's the kind of question you'll get on the architect exam. A B testing, possibly, but it would probably be almost like in the that's part of the scenario. Oh, you're doing an A B test, and you've deployed, you know, two versions of the applications, and and somehow the answer is how do you route traffic or, you know. Yeah, what would, what would be a command or something like that to do it? So you might you might get that at like a more detailed level where you have to think about conceptually why would you use A-B testing at the architect exam. And in the cloud uh, engineer exam, it would be you somebody's already decided you're using A-B testing and how do you – and then specifically, it'll, it'll ask you how do you do this specific task. That's a good question. All right. Um, so, oh, go, go ahead, Dan. Yeah. Oh, no, I was going to say, so that's it. Um, 
for sort of the um, kind of cloud, the test strategy and things like that. And now I've got a bunch of slides where I talk about um, like Compute Engine, Kubernetes Engine, App Engine, all that stuff. I'm happy to dig into that or um, we can do more questions. Then uh, one more question. Well, hey, let, uh, if we could, let's go ahead and put questions in the um, um, in the chat or in the the silo. But go ahead with your go ahead um, and and, and, and speak your question, Nago. Yeah, go ahead. I'm, I'm listening. We're all listening, Nicole. Uh, did I miss anything right? And, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead, Chad. Yeah. Uh, so the, the, this is regarding cloud armor. Uh, on the, uh, uh, can you please explain a little bit on the cloud armor? Because on the theory, it's 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 very it's bit difficult to understand. Maybe you can help with basic understanding. I, I'm sorry, my connection went bad. I wasn't. What is the topic? I explain which. Hello. Uh, so uh, I was. Kind of difficult to understand. Yeah, Nicole, yeah, can you go ahead and, and, and type, type your question, question in? Yeah. Let's go. Uh, let's, let's go ahead and continue, continue to use the, the chat. chat. And, and even, even better, better, use the side low uh, to, uh, to present your questions. Your questions. Uh, and, and then, because um, uh, sometimes, sometimes it's, it's, it can be it can difficult. Be difficult. Um, um, I, I, was I was trying to pick that out. out. I, I, know I know that he's, he's asking, asking some, some of the differences. Oh, right. There you go. Um, there you go. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's take a quick look. Yeah, that is a new survey. Something about the cloud armor. Yeah. yeah. I'm just trying, uh, it's difficult to understand. Yep. And I don't remember exactly. I'm actually going to Google it right now because I'm not exactly sure how much is included with cloud armor so that's so a good that's question thank you for like using the chat on that one yeah this is a great question um okay i'm just reading this uh denial of service attack web uh oh i don't hear you anymore then you are muted something then you are muted can you unmute yourself He's uh, he's lip syncing. I posted <laughs> the link for the questions, so you can uh, post your questions. I think Dan is muted. Yep. Hey, I'm sorry about that. No worries. <laughs> I apologize. Um, okay, Cloud Armor. Yeah, it's a new service, um, and it's uh, called a web application firewall. And if you're familiar with uh, networking and the seven-layer model. Like the OSI model of networking, there's a, at the very low level you have like the hardware, and then like at level three you have like TCP, IP, and when you configure a like a network firewall and you block certain ports or certain protocols like P, you want to block that. That's a network level firewall, and the logic, your your rules are basically at the level of like ports and protocols. With a web application firewall, you're at what's known as layer seven, so the top of the sort of application stack, and your your rules are associated at like application logic level, and so you can create rules like only let HTTP traffic that has a certain payload structure through. Web Armor is web application firewall, so it allows you to create rules like that to protect your application. So in addition to setting up firewalls that like block traffic, um, you this allows you to analyze the traffic that does get through the network firewall and apply more logic to it so that you can filter out things. And it also gives you access to like Google's technology for like denial of service attacks. So um, you know if somebody wanted to hit your um, your VM DOS this would basically protect you from that, and and which is great because you know I'm not a networking expert. I don't want to worry about DDoS, um, so that's where Cloud Armor comes in. That's great. That's great. Yep. yep. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Great question. Yeah. Questions from the Slido, please. Yeah, here's another one, um, which uh, I thought, I thought was, was interesting. interesting is, is what's, what's the, the difference, difference between Google Run? run? Versus, versus Google, Google App, App Engine, Engine versus, versus Cloud, cloud functions. functions, right? I think, I think all of those, those are compute instances. instances. Is, that Is that the right way of saying it? it? Um, um, but, but some, some of them are more on demand. demand. Like, how, how, what would, uh, uh, if, if, if we're, we're being, being asked about the difference about between those or, or if we should, should be using one or the other, other what's, what's the secret, the secret there? there? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, okay. Um, cloud functions is event driven. So a cloud function only executes in response to something happening, like a file being uploaded to cloud storage or a message um, being written to a cloud pub sub topic. So um, the, the distinction there, and somebody put it in the, uh, the chat, and thank you. All three services are serverless. So that's their common thing. But they are different in that cloud function is event driven and um, you can only um, write code or write a function in a certain set of languages. Um, and that function could only run for some period of time. I don't remember what the longest period is, maybe 10 minutes. Or it might be like a minute by default, but if you can extend it up to 10. So cloud function is very short running. And it just it's a way of responding to an event. Cloud Run and App Engine Flexible both run containers, Docker containers. Cloud Function does not run containers. It runs just a, a single piece of code. And well, in the background, your code is running in a container somewhere, but you don't to that. In Cloud Run, you get to configure, and Cloud and App Engine, you get to configure which whatever you want in your Docker engine, and you can run those. Cloud Run is a managed service for for stateless containers. Um, so you can use Cloud Run. Um, Cloud Run is probably going to be the where you would want to run your containers if you want to have minimal management. Um, App Engine Flexible may give you more features with regards to things like A-B testing and routing um, and things like that. So you might want to use continue to use App Engine there. I don't know if Cloud Run supports that yet. Um, otherwise, you um, yeah you could yeah man choose choose either. That's great. But That's really I, good. I, yep yep yep. So here's, so here's a question, a question more, more about, about the exam, exam itself, itself. Um, and, and this, this says okay. for the, for the online, online proctored exam, exam would you, you need, need to remove or cover up books, books on the shelf, shelf such, such as those, those behind the <laughs> man? <laughs> you know I don't know. I think as long as you don't have them open and reading from them, I think that's the critical thing. So, so give, give us a little, little I, think I think I know, I know but, but give us a little context about why, why, why they're, they're asking, asking that question. question. Uh, I, I'll, I'll jump, jump in. in. It's, it's fun. fun. When, when you're taking, taking a test, test um, it's, it's fun, fun because, because basically you have to stay, stay in front of the camera, camera no potty breaks. The screen is, you know, looking for you to stay put and maybe, you know, I don't, I have, I wish I knew what it was doing to figure out whether you're cheating or not, right? It, yeah, but, but I think I that's, that's uh, I think it's a fun, fun question. question. Um, if, if you've you taken these tests, tests, you know that there, there are restrictions, restrictions and, and I don't quite understand them. them. Um, so uh, I thought that, I thought was, that was fun. fun. <laughs> yeah. 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 Another question, uh, Dan, for you. What kind of roles can we apply uh, for after we get certified as uh, uh, social engineers? I think this is an important question. Yeah, it really is. And um, it would basically be. Um, any kind of, well, anything of course with the cloud engineer in it or from a DevOps perspective, um, uh, like a, an SRE, a stability engineer, um, basically, um, oh, it used to be, in, to go with a system administrator back when we you know, we ended up managing one or two machines. Um, but yeah, so I would go with anything that has like a system administration title, cloud engineer, uh, DevOps engineer, um, although with DevOps engineers, sometimes it's more like application development. Um, site reliability engineer is a good one. Um, yeah, I would say those are probably probably the main ones. Here's a good question. Is this is something that I, I've struggled with is, uh, hey, Dan, what would be your biggest tip to improve the I am part of the exam? So, right, identity is a big part of this. Um, what, what do you have to say about that? Uh, to, improve, to improve to improve the quality of the exam or improve your chances of getting the IAM questions right? Mm, you know, <laughs> I'm, let's, let's go, go with how to how to do a better how to um, take, take the test, the test better. better. Let's, let's not, not let's not try, try to improve, improve their exam. <laughs> okay, let's say uh, let's say and look at permissions, like how permissions are named. And look at how roles are named. There is a structure to them, um, 
and I would say, understand, like, read enough of them so you can kind of recognize a, a role or permission name that you may have never seen before, but you can pick it apart. Oh, this is about BigQuery, and it's an admin thing, and it's a, something about a read, and it's like, because there is a structure to those, so I would say get familiar with specific roles, like the names of those roles and the names of the permissions. I would say that's one thing. I would say no, just hands down, no question, the difference between predefined roles, custom roles, and primitive roles, yes. and when to use each. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and this, is, this has changed a little bit recently, hasn't it? There's been a little bit newer update to how the IAM roles are uh, managed and distributed. I just ran into this uh, recently, and so I thought that was a great question because, um, uh, like you said, there were predefined roles, but the ability to create custom roles is, 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 um, is, is pretty advanced in the last year. And also, um, some things that I used to have access to, they, they've really buttoned that down, and there's a, there's a lot more roles. And, 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 um, but maybe you can talk about that. There is one more question more personal for you, Dan. Are you planning to write the study guide for the rest GCP exams like cloud engineer, DevOps, security, etc., and cloud fellow as well? Thanks. Uh, no, blown by what? I wrote three books in two years. I, I'm taking a rest. <laughs> much. Um, I don't know if um, others are in the works, but yeah, I don't, at least not right now, I don't foresee it or so. Someone, Someone asks, asks um, is your, your course, course enough, enough to, uh, to uh, complete? Uh, so, uh, so if we take your course, course is that enough to complete an exam? exam? It, right? Like Anonymous uh, asks, uh, is, uh, is uh, let me, I'll, I'll read it. Yeah. Uh, not, so, so, yeah, yeah the specific, specific question is, 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 your, is your course enough to pass GCP, GCP associates, associates, or do we need to supplement with other courses? I would say you need to supplement with hands-on work. Like, if you read the book or took Coursera, did any one of those, and then did sufficient work hands-on, then you can pass. Um, the critical thing I would say is, you know, these other resources like Coursera or the book, they give you a sense of the breadth of what's covered on the exam, and that's really important. Um, and also some of the details that you need to know, like, you know, near-line storage, you're going to access that less than once every 30 days. That's the kind of stuff you can pick up from the book um, and the course. And that's, you know, one of those or two of those is probably enough for that. But I'd say the critical thing is work with GCP in the console and the command line. Yeah. That's great. So, so the answer is no. No book. Like, I, wouldn't, I would never recommend, like, reading a book or reading all the books books up there taking all the Udemy exam, uh, courses and doing all the quick labs and then walk into the exam. I can't imagine how anybody would pass. You really have to, you, you know, just... just ooh, Use quick labs for uh, practicing, right? Uh, lots of quick labs. Uh, lots of quick labs. Yep, lots of quick labs. And quick labs are great. I'm a huge fan of those and I recommend doing them, but that's not enough. Yeah, exactly. Linda, do you, you have another question? question? No, I was reading from but you can go. Yeah, so, yeah, here's, so here's a, a there's, there's another, another question, question here. here. Let's, Let's see. see. It's fun, it's to, fun watch to watch these because as people, people vote, they, they, they shuffle, shuffle in order. order. Um, oh, oh, gosh, gosh I just had a good one and I lost it. it. Let's, Let's see. see. Uh, uh, which quick lab is I'll a must for GCP association prep? Oh, I'm sorry. Can we repeat that? Sure. Which quick lab is a must for GCP association prep? We were just, we were just talking, talking about Quick Labs. labs. Which, Which one would you one recommend? recommend? Yeah. Gosh, I don't know. I haven't looked at Quick Labs in a while. I don't know what's out there. Let me just see if I can do a quick look and just see what's available right now. Um, and I'll, 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 say I'll say this out loud. Out loud. Um, I've, I've only, only experienced Quick Labs through Coursera. Coursera. Maybe, Maybe there's, there's another, another path. path. Uh, is, there is there a there list, a list where you can just go through them, them uh, independently, independently of Coursera? Yeah. yeah. Yes, uh, there is. Okay. Yeah, there's a there's a quick lab. Q excuse IK Labs dot com, um, and I'm just looking through here. For quick labs, creating a virtual machine. You certainly you want to do creating a virtual machine. Uh, Computer engine, quick start Windows. Uh, getting started with Cloud Shell and G Cloud, I'd recommend. Kubernetes engine, quick start. Yep. 
set up network and load balancer. Yep, I would take recommend that one. Uh, yeah, I don't see others listed. That's Google Cloud Essentials. Here's a, 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 a question I really like. Uh, it has to do with whether to learn the, the shell um, or, hold on, let me find this again here. Um, or, or the GCP the console. console. That's a, that's, that's a, a kind of a high, that's a deep question, question, right? Uh, should I, should we prioritize cloud shell or GCP console? Uh, actually, they're really, they're, they're different things. Cloud shell is basically, um, a, it gives you like a bash shell. It's like a, a command line, a bash command line that runs in a, a small container on the cloud and it gives you access. And once you start up cloud shell, Cloud Shell comes with G Cloud already installed. So it's really all you're doing is using, you're, when you're in Cloud Shell, you're using G Cloud. So if you learn G Cloud, you can run those commands from your local machine or you can run them from within Cloud Shell. It's really, it's really just, just whether, whether you're running, running it locally running. or whether you're running um, it in the cloud with their instances. Exactly. Right. So I use Cloud Shell all the time because it's you know I don't have to like jump back to my machine. I can do it in the browser. It's really great. And and basically, it, and also um, your Cloud Shell uh, like your history and stuff will persist. So if you shut it down, and start it up again, you oh. can go back and use your history. I didn't know that. That's pretty neat. We're getting some love in the chat for Cloud Shell, so that's great. Yeah, I love Cloud Shell. Yeah, <laughs> it's a well earned love. All right, I'm, I'm just scanning, scanning some of the other questions, questions here. here. Linda, let, let me know, know if you have, have one that you see that's pretty good here. here. Um, I have one. Yeah. Uh, then how transferable is our experience of getting certification from other cloud providers as, uh, such as Azure, Azure and AWS? Um, and so the question is, does it help to have? Yeah. How, uh, how can you transfer your experience that you already have uh, as AWS or Azure to, Google, to GCP? Sure. Um, well, from an architecture perspective, it's pretty straightforward because it's very similar. I mean, we work with the same concepts. I mean, designing scalable, reliable, distributed systems, it's pretty much the same. Um, so things like understanding how to use load balancing, messaging, um, different like cloud native design patterns. So at an architectural level, it transfers over pretty easily. Um, conceptually, like um, the concepts map over. Things like the G Cloud or the AWS command line, they're really different. Um, so you, you've got to learn the specifics of different things. Also, um, like running Kubernetes, if you spin up a Kubernetes cluster in AWS and use Kube Control, that's the same as using Kube Control in a cluster that you spin up in, uh, in GKE. So um, I would say if you're an architect, the stuff will transfer fairly easy. At a cloud engineer level, there's probably less. You probably get a little practice, like the, the tests are similar. So, you know, test taking probably carry over as well. Yeah, there was a similar question. If somebody has already AWS Solution Architect certification, which GCP certification and material would be, would you recommend it? I know that there is a course that is special for these people in Coursera, but if you can say more about it. Yeah, in that case, if you've already done the architect on, on AWS, you might want to go straight for the professional cloud architect. Um, but again, do, you know, get some hands-on work. Um, and the architect exam uses three case studies. Um, so when you go look at the exam guide for the architect, look at the um, studies. There are three case studies, and you want to know those inside and out um, before you go into the exam. That's great. That's great. So, so I have, I have a, a, a one. one um, the second, second question, question I'll ask has, has to do with, with the order of, of should I do this and then that and then, that and then this? But before, before I ask that, that question, question um, let, let me come back, back to uh, uh, someone, someone wanting, wanting to know what you're, what you're going to do next. next. So, so are you are planning, planning to write a study guide for the rest of GCP exams? exams? Example, example, cloud engineer, engineer DevOps, uh, security. Right? That, oh, that's right. That's right. You said you've written three already this year. I guess I'm anxious for your next one. So maybe I'm just re-asking the question. Um, and, and so, so anyway, so that, that, that next, next question, question then is uh, JavaScript, JavaScript developer, developer here. here. Um, um, if, if you're, you're transitioning, transitioning from JavaScript, 
um, uh, just, just, you know, you know I, I'm, I'm a, a, maybe a full stack. stack. Um, how, how would you, you transi transi transition, transition into, into cloud, cloud DevOps, DevOps, site reliability engineer, engineer besides, besides getting, getting the certs? The certs. Um, well, that's a really good question. So basically, so someone who's you know, a developer and is focused primarily on development and now wants to move into more of the like uh, cloud engineering architecture kind of thing, um, I would say, so there's sort of two forks. There's what can you do on your own and what can you do in your job? Like if you're in a position where you're maybe a developer, I would say, you know, as much as possible, try and do as much operational work as possible. Um, so there are things you might be able to do as a developer, like if you can set up a, a continuous integration, continuous deployment, CI, CD environment, um, you can do that in Google Cloud. Or um, if you're not using, yeah, maybe you're using GitHub, but maybe, you, you know, if you can transition and use Cloud Repository, I would say, Start using the Google tools like Cloud Repository, Cloud Builder. Um, use, start using those as much as possible um, in your work, you know, whenever you can do that. And then also sort of on your own, pick a project. Um, like imagine like build an application all the way through, especially if you have backend experience as well. You know, set it up in a VM and use Cloud Data Store as the backend and you know, just get a toy database running, something like that, and then move that over to a container and run that in Kubernetes engine, then run it in Cloud Run. Like that's, if you can do that kind of thing, then you're really well on your way to being an engineer. There is another question for you, uh, Dan. What uh, are the advantages of GCP over other providers and why is getting, is growing so fast? Um, yeah, I get that question a lot because um, I actually started, I also have AWS certifications. I like AWS. I'm actually spending most of my work time these days in AWS. So um, I, I'm never, I, I'm not critical of AWS or Azure or any of the others. I use GCP um, and like it better because it is, there are lower barriers to entry to get things done. Um, if you go into AWS, there are a lot of services, there, there are a lot of pieces. If you think of this as a puzzle, when you're putting something together in the cloud, when you go into AWS, it's like a thousand piece puzzle and you've got to put all these pieces together, especially like at the low level, networking level, security groups, you have to configure NACLs, network access, control list. And it's just, there's a lot of moving parts that you need to configure. You don't have to do that in Google. In Google, you go in, you create your VM, you know, by default, things are set up. Um, so for example, your VPC is global. You don't need to worry about um, having uh, to, to set up routes between different regions like you do in AWS. And so with Google, part of it is it's much easier to get up and running, get your infrastructure up and running. The other thing is, is that they have services, core serverly valuable for building um, like cloud native applications, like cloud pub subs there, BigQuery is there, BigTear, um, Dataflow is there. Um, it, and there's a lot of support for, um, years ago, like, I don't know, maybe like five years ago, people would complain about Google Cloud and say, you know, oh, Google Cloud's only a good option if you want to run your applications the way Google does. And that's true. That was definitely true five years ago, and it's, all, and it's still true to a large degree now. But the thing is, more and more of us are running our systems the way Google does. You know, we're using containers. We're doing continuous deployments. So in, in Google Cloud, it's much easier to get up and running and going. And it's much fewer headaches, I have found. So now there are disadvantages. Um, you know, I think there are more tools, more services. So if you have like some esoteric specific need, there's probably a service for it in AWS. They might not be wanting in Google Cloud. That's my. That's He's asking for the slides. Uh, as we said, they, they will be sent after the meetup. We, uh, all the GDG leads will send to their attendees. So do not worry for that. You'll receive the link for the slides. If you have other questions about the uh, meetup group for uh, uh, preparing for uh, the exam, uh, you can join us. Uh, all of our GDGs, we will meet this weekend again, I think it's tomorrow. 
and you can have all the questions answered there. So all the questions that are not related to them, let's skip them, please. All right, All right, so, so what, what is, is the, the um, what, what is, is left, left for our, our event, event today, today right? right? We, we um, how are you how feeling, feeling, Dan? Are we are, are we in a, in a good spot? I'm good. Yeah, I'm happy. A lot of questions. If people have other questions, just say if you want to send them to me on LinkedIn, I'd be happy to answer. Yep, I, we're seeing a lot. I don't, of, yeah, I don't want to cut into. You don't want to cut into raffle time, right? <laughs> raffle time is what people are asking yeah, about now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we, we've rolled the credits for about as long as we can, and now we, we, we need the, we need the uh, spoiler. <laughs> One second, I will share my screen. And before we go to, the, are you okay with that? Do you want to add anything else before we? No, oh, I'm also going to over and I'll send you the, the new slide deck and get yeah. the right now. You can't hear so, because everyone's mic is muted. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Can everybody see the screen or not? I can see your screen, Linda. Yes. So I'm sharing now in uh, in chat. If my chat will start to work, it's kind of frozen. My computer is getting. Uh, here is the um, feedback form with which we will uh, collect the names for the raffle. So please go ahead and give us uh, your feedback. That's right. So and then. And in, the okay. and in the meantime, we will have some announcements, the sponsors, what the raffle, and things like this. Linda, can you put that link in the chat, please? Sorry? Uh, oh, can you put that link in the chat? Yeah, it is already in the chat, I think. Can everybody see it? Oh, I, yep, I see One it now. Second. I, I do I see it now. now. Yep. Is that my computer that doesn't want to cooperate? You have too many browsers and things. So That's the trick. So many windows these days. Yep. Um, <laughs> is, is, is everyone having an okay time getting into that spreadsheet? Or, I'm, or sorry, I'm sorry, that, that form, form, that link is to a form. And if and you'll, you'll fill out that, that form, form, your name's going, going to be added to a sheet, and we're going to add your name to the wheel of names. names. So, so if you can very quickly get, get through that, that form, form uh, you, you should be, be seeing, seeing questions, questions about uh, uh, your name, um, your email address, how would, how would you rate, rate the event, event? If you just want to click, click through those really quickly, quickly, we will, from, from that, that, we will get your email, email and, um, and we will add that to the wheel of names. The name. We will the name. Name, thank you, Linda. That's why we're asking for your name, actually. Please put your full name in, and we'll put your full name into the wheel of names. Uh, we will not use your email, like Linda was just saying. Uh, but you, if you want to be in this raffle, you have to fill out this form. So please fill out this form right now if you want to be a participant in the raffle. Okay, so we will have some announcements. Are all the GPGs uh, leads ready to do their announcements? Daniel, are you ready, please? Just a moment, Linda. So, people who are uh, is tuning in from YouTube Live in uh, the Marishas, uh, Marishas uh, GDG and Linda, you post the feedback link on YouTube Live as well. In the chat, we cannot post the links. Uh -huh. so. uh, yeah. But... Uh, uh, Oh, yeah. with the, uh, with the we drop. can put a comment in a, a meetup. Can every, can anybody put in their meetup say comment? I'm really sorry, I didn't think of it. You are right, and we cannot edit meetup uh, event mm -hmm. after the event is started. We cannot. Can any can everybody take care of this? I'm sorry, guys. Next time, we we'll think. Yeah, of it. Time. But in the meantime, while they're doing it, go to the like Manning website and start choosing the book or the project or video the most what you like the most. Once it's in your shopping cart, uh, if you win, uh, you will let me know your email address, you will commenting, and I will let no publisher to unlock the product for you. Personally, I'm a big sucker for those. Uh, I learned the most from something called MAP, M-A-E-P, Manning Early Access Program. Those are the books in the writings, but they are good quality. There are forms. You can even impact how the book is written. And over the years, I even became friends with the authors of those books and some of them were guests 
that serverless program for meetups too. So, so that would be my tip. Uh, during COVID times, they expanded into live projects. They did not take any. But I remember the study, a cloud study and people were asking for real projects. If you attend one of those or choose one of those live projects, you will have a group uh, like learning experience. And some of them are like kind of uh, just uh, machine learning and AI. It's a cross cloud part of it. So, so uh, they are offering five prizes, right? Yes. Yes. Or five yes. Prizes. Okay. yes. And I suggest that none of our organizers get prizes. If my name is drawn, I'm not winning to somebody else. Oh, man. Yeah. I bummed a little. No, no. Oh, no, no, but uh, so we are organizers. We are normally, like, we, we don't participate. I'm just teasing. So, so uh, tell me when you are ready, like. Uh, 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 John, are you ready to present uh, the next uh, prizes for the raffle? Yep, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, we're going to have uh, this wheel to uh, show the uh, different prizes that are available. There are a total of. Uh, 10, 5 Manning, 3 Udemy, which are this, as shown here, is Dan's course on Udemy that we've been going through currently every Sunday during the uh, cloud study session. And then there will be two Yandex scholarships. Yeah, so next, I think, so uh, next is uh, O'Reilly, I think, let me just say something, yeah. Michelle, are you ready? Michelle, are you ready? As we're waiting for Michelle to give us some information here, um, Dan, didn't you say O'Reilly? Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Yeah, we don't want anyone to leave behind without anything. So we are giving every attendee who has attended from morning 30 days access to O'Reilly Learning Platform. If you have read any of their books, they're awesome. So here is the link in the chat. I would suggest also to all the GDG leads to send, when we send the dance uh, slides, to send this link to the attendees. What do you think? It's a good idea because we cannot post it for everyone. Yeah. So. Yeah, like, uh, or really. Yeah. Ask us not to share this on social media, but yes, you can uh, send this link to your attendees via email. And yeah, not share the, this link on social media. Yeah. Don't post it in social networks, but uh, send it only to your attendees, okay? Thank you. Sorry, Prakti Andex, uh, we will offer two uh, sheets of 50% discount to Prakti combines with good terms to choose from web developer, data scientist, and data analyst. The codes are valid until June 30th. Uh, Practicum is a fully supported remote boot camp to uh, land your uh, ideal tech job. Students receive 24 7 uh, reports from tutors, code reviewers, and peers. Learn the soft skills that will get them hired and get up to 15 real life projects. So uh, now, uh, uh, we will have a few announcements before we go to close the uh, wrap up. So, next is Daniel. Oh, it's me again. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. So, so, we kind of randomly met uh, now after COVID. You can go anywhere in the world, and I love this group you're doing. So, uh, I want to invite you to join a serverless Toronto user group. It's a cloud agnostic, it's just we build able to manage services, other people's API, and, and simplification of the IT. That's why our motto is home of less IT mess. And uh, two upcoming events that we have, which are now virtual, like the first one I've been planning like since the Icon Canada, where I met the book author, like he's from Montreal, and he's also manning the author. So you can, uh, don't get his book right now, because he's going to be giving, I think, six books of his own uh, for the meetup on 25th. And, and uh, what's a beautiful thing about PySpark, it sounds niche, but it's an uh, engine under the hood of AWS Blue and also data proc in, in GCP. So whichever cloud you do, and if you want to go deep, uh, you will need to learn something about uh, PySpark. And it's a Python uh, kind of thing. Uh, and another thing is, like, uh, when this COVID started, you all experienced so much waiting time on the phone, uh, phone lines were dying. Like, I, I just got so frustrated with this, and, and I worked with the Twilio. 
uh, and I invited the engineers to explain how a legacy contact center can scale into the cloud. And they're going to show how to build simple IVRs in the cloud. They're going to show how to build like uh, AI-based IVRs as well, using like chatbots. And also they're going to uh, show networking how, how you can extend using SIP headers, connectivity from the legacy sites into the cloud. So we just want to help you help businesses if they're downsizing. If you learn this, you will be probably able to get jobs and, and stay there at help and scale that telecommunication. So that's it. It's all serverless managed services. But there are people asking if you can share the, the links that you were talking oh, about. Yes. So you, see how, like, you will go to the serverlesstoronto.org. If you go back to the slide, go back to the slide. Oh, sorry. Serverlesstoronto.org is the domain that will take you to Meetup page. And if you see our events, these links are clickable. <laughs> like here, so serverlesstoronto.org will take you to meetups, and then we will sign up there. And please join us. I'm trying to grow uh, the community now that we are virtual. It took me two and a half years to get to almost 1,500 members now with your help and the online. I hope I will uh, be able to match 2,000 membership like you have. So. Okay, next. Uh, are you ready, Vishal? Yes. yes. Oh, okay. I'm here again. Thank you, everyone, for staying till today. If anyone is still interested to continue your cloud learning and interested in machine learning ops, which is MLOps, new thing in cloud, feel free to join us uh, using the link. Uh, I'm also post chat. You'll also get access to free quick labs for 30 days, which we have been talking about. So you can track your labs, which are the lab you want. And we will also have a chance to get our answer questions answered uh, from Google speaker, which is uh, Vivin. He has been customer engineer with Google and he has experience in cloud uh, from the past 10 years. We also have a surprise raffle and also a few JetBrains licenses to give away on that day. Just make sure to join us. Thank you. Thank you. Anna, are you ready? Yes, Thank you, Linda. I'm ready. Very happy to be here. My name is Anna. I represent uh, GDG New York. I'm here to give you a call for, for volunteers. Uh, my colleague Ralph and I have started uh, helping the Foundation Positive Planet, which uh, addresses a very important issue today to help the most vulnerable start the business. The Foundation uh, has been around for 20 years. And the founder is a very famous uh, European economist, uh, Jack Attali. Now, we, uh, the foundation is uh, launching in the US and will have local projects, again, helping unemployed with financing, with training. And uh, we need to start getting uh, funds and donors. And uh, here's your chance to. Um, Please uh, help us uh, donate a few work in development, uh, marketing, strategic planning, whatever uh, whatever your passion is. What do you have to do for yourself? The head of the foundation and the chairwoman of the board of directors is Ingrid Gonzalez. She is a, a Google Cloud executive here in New York, so it's she's putting together a team and uh, to get to work with her. And what we're doing is, of course, uh, also in Google Cloud, we need to figure out a way to accept donations and start launching this um, a super important business and cause. I will post my email and um, LinkedIn info in the chat, but any of the GDG NYC channels are also appropriate. And um, thank you very much for the opportunity, and I love uh, seeing here everyone today. Thank you so much, everybody. And we are having other events coming up, so please, everybody, to your GDGs, uh, groups, and uh, RSPB, and you will get uh, uh, a chance to... We have a big e event coming up, which is... Uh, one sec. If I can get it quickly, otherwise... Uh, soon we will uh, close our, uh, there is the flood day, if anyone is interested, and we have this online uh, rapid prototyping, uh, prototyping with Flutter and Firebase. 
and we have also this is a big event uh, with the other GDGs organized where we will have all leads from Google talking for us. So if anyone is interested, most of our GDGs are already collaborating and they published their uh, uh, meet and you can go and join. Yes, hey, Eli, can I ask you a question? infrastructure in Google Cloud. So if I miss any of this uh, talk, where can I find on YouTube or anywhere? Uh, if you go in the Slack, if you join tomorrow, uh, we will give you more uh, more insights about it. Uh, you can always do it in Slack. You have all the instructions with all the steps. But if you join tomorrow or next week, we will give you more uh, instructions. So go to the raffle. Okay. Well, I'm sorry. It's just because we are running out of time. Where is the raffle link? First, let's go to the love names. The feedback form. Can somebody send me quickly the feedback form? I think. Yes, yes, if you haven't filled out that, that form, form, do it now. Wow. We can add your name in as, as we go, go if it's missing. Um, if, um, if you, you win, win uh, uh, once, once, you, you will, will be removed, removed and, and you, you will only win, win once. once. So, so um, your, name your name is taken out after, after you have been a winner. winner. So, so the Rafa, uh, the, the form, we have 161 answers. I think I will go for it and uh, uh, we will see what... Uh, I don't know, maybe I should just... What is that of mine? No, I'm just no, bringing a little music, music while we wait. I hope that's okay. okay. I thought his mind doing that noise. This is what you get when you search game show music on the Apple. Okay, so now where is my Apple? This is what you get when you search game show music on the Apple. Oh, so many names. <laughs> Can we take the noise, please? The noise, the background noise, I can hear you, please. That's Chad playing the music. Uh -huh. Can you take the noise, please? Yep, it's down. Can you? Are you hitting the spin button? Ah, okay. So, so we will start to raffle. Uh, John, can you tell us for what we raffle in water? And, and I have only one uh, question. If you already have a course and you don't have nobody to give it, you can give it to somebody in attendance as a gift, or you can say uh, that you want to pass it and we will take you from the raffle, or we leave you in the raffle and we'll give your prize to somebody else. But uh, uh, only if you have uh, the, the book or something. Uh, I have most of it, <laughs> and I'm not in the raffle. Okay, so, John. Yeah. <coughs> So, like I said, we have uh, ten prizes today, five Manning, three Udemy, and let's go with uh, one of the prize winners first. Linda, that's my, I do not like my game show music. So that's a, a Manning winner, Necro yeah. Congratulations. So let's go to the next one. Yep, let's go for a... Uh, a Udemy prize. We have three Udemy prizes. Let's try that. Okay. Let's collect the names of the winners, please. Yes, I'm writing down. Lawrence Louie. Lawrence Louie gets a Udemy prize. Congratulations, Lawrence. Uh, let's do a Yandex scholarship. Okay, I will shuffle a little bit. Anyways, we cannot even see the names, but that's okay. Oh, 
winner. Congratulations. Next. For a, uh, we have two prizes left in Udemy. Let's try Udemy. Yeah. Allie Elstein. Congratulations. Congratulations. Sharif is a winner of Udemy. All right, we have one more Yandex. Okay, let's for, the, for the last of the Yandex scholarships. Gideon, a long Congratulations. Gideon. Give me one second. Congratulations. I, I'm cheering for you, but in silence. All right, All right. that uh, this is our last, that was the last of our Yandex. This yeah. will be our last Manning prize winner. Yeah. Ah, so I go for what? For Manning? Yes, ma'am. Manning. Okay. Rod, you were a winner of a Manning publication. Give me one second. Mm -hmm. yeah, huh? <laughs> All the winners are writing in chat. <laughs> That's it. All right, we have two, pardon me, we have three, three Udemy prizes left. Let's go for a Udemy prize. How many we have left? We have three. How many we have left? You have yeah, two money here. Right. You, you have two uh, two Udemy's already? So you have pardon me, you have one yeah. Udemy left. There you go. Okay, one Udemy. So we are raffling now for Udemy course? Yep, this is the last one of the Udemy's. Okay. Sorry, I don't, I don't need it. I, oh, I do okay. So, First, I'm organized. The second, I already have yeah. it. So I purchased it and okay, so the course. We, Thank you, then. We pass you, okay? One okay. more time for the Udemy course. I have myself all the courses, then, and everything book. <laughs> <laughs> He's very happy. I can see it in his chat. All right, that's a you to me. Joe Maldonado, congratulations. All right, so we have two more of the Manning publications. Let's try to spin for a Manning. Yeah, okay, I know. Congratulations, Jose, for a uh, Manning Publications winner. We have one more. This is it. Can Everybody I remove this one? Uh, yes, ma'am. Remove. Not going to this, sorry. <laughs> okay, I'll shuffle one more and let's go. Mark, Mark, you 
Congrats everyone for instructions of contact me on LinkedIn. Uh, uh, connect with me, uh, whoever won, and communicate. We have the emails of the winners. I will share with everybody with the GDG leads, and we can contact the winners. But they have to use the same email address for the manning as well. If they use another address, I, I cannot help them. Ah, okay. So can I remove the last uh, winner? So we are done with the raffle, right? Yes, ma'am. Perfect. So, uh, does anyone like to say anything else before? I, mean, I would like, first of all, to thank everybody. It was very stressful today, and uh, we had so many problems, but in the end, we got things to work. <laughs> that was for our first experience with streaming, and we met for like two weeks through testing everything and still we had problems today so this doesn't mean nothing testing <laughs> i don't know I th we, we, met we met once for streaming on this that was pretty rough we'll know next time to practice more often but i think the people that were here probably had a good experience if you were watching on the live stream that might have been a little rougher <laughs> we have to go back if you guys go back and watch the live stream you'll see a very, a very different, different experience, experience where, where we've, we've got, got glitching, glitching, we've got, got the microphone, microphone like, like cutting, cutting out, and, and uh, so, so we've definitely, definitely learned a lot. lot. I'm, I'm glad, glad you guys got, got to see the meat experience, experience and not the live stream experience. experience. We'll, we'll have to keep working on that one. Actually, we met like five, six times to test everything. So yeah, and no, all the no, not right. <laughs> no, we <laughs> met once. We tried once. If we had met five times, we probably would have succeeded 100%. Uh, uh, I wanted perfect, to right? thank all the DDGs that uh, participated in all our meetings to make this happen. We had uh, uh, several meetings and tried to make everything work. Uh, so, but there are always things that happen, so we apologize for it. Uh, we learn a lot and next time we'll make it uh, much better. I hope you guys had as much fun as we did. Yeah, I would like to thank Dan from the bottom of my heart for joining our community, for sharing his knowledge with us, and uh, if you like to say something. No, this was great. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. I really enjoyed this. I thought there were great questions. They, you know, help me understand better how to how to uh, you know kind of do these kind of sessions so yeah and just feel free to message me anytime i'm always happy to help if you're about to take the test or have other questions just let me know thank you i think everybody got your message so i think it's pretty open for all of you <laughs> thank you so much yeah, yeah thanks man yeah, so long ago take care so, so we're, we're gonna, gonna officially call, call this done, done. Um, um i've stopped, stopped the stream, the stream. And, and I'm going, going to, stop to stop the recording, recording now. now. And, and um, so, so if, if people, people want to just sort of uh, open, open up and, and chat amongst, amongst yourselves, yourselves that's, that's fine. This, this is, is now an open forum. forum. This, this is no longer the event. event. So, so we're, we're not, not recording. recording. Yeah, and yeah, I would just like to say, yeah, thank you, Chad. Yeah, uh, yeah. So whoever is there, uh, whoever is willing to show up on video, just to make sure we get connected better, we can take a screenshot of all awesome people with the video, uh, if you turn on your video. Oh, oh you're, 